All right, good morning. I have 830, so we are going to go ahead and begin. Uh, my name is Sergeant First Class Ken Martinson. I am the interim Yellow Ribbon Director for the National Guard Yellow Ribbon Program for the state of North Carolina. Uh, welcome to the, the pre-deployment event for the 694th. Uh, and first off, we have uh, Colonel Barron that would like to say a few words. Good morning. Uh, just a quick mic check. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, I'll be quick. Uh, you guys got a long day. Uh, but I just wanted to say thank you for jumping on. Uh, hopefully we have some of the families on. Um, and for you guys, whether this is your first, second, fifth deployment, um, they're going to put out some really good stuff today. So do your best, uh, pay attention, ask a lot of questions, uh, and then make sure you uh, take advantage of the programs that they're going to offer um, because they are uh, really good. Um, I know um, that when I deployed, I, I kind of blew this part off. And when I came back, I had a million questions and some stuff I would have done a lot better uh, the first time. So um, if you guys are new to it, um, you know, pay attention if you're, if you've done it a few times again, uh, ask the questions, uh, make sure you take advantage of everything they're going to talk about today because it is really uh, great, and really helpful. So, um, I'll stay on for a minute if you guys got questions, uh, but that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Staff Sergeant Brian Hill, and he's going to go through uh, the timeline for today's events. Good morning, 694th. Uh, my name is Staff Sergeant Hill. So for today, we're going to start with uh, after me, it's going to be Chaplain Watson's invocation. And then we have Address Your Stress by DeAnthony Harris. And then we have our first block of presenters. And they're going to go through child and youth, family programs, JAG, employment, education, Red Cross. Uh, Chaplain Watson's going to do a short presentation on how to grow during your deployment, casualty affairs, and then IBHS with Kevin Sears. Um, during these events, you can ask questions on the Facebook page. We'll get these questions answered as fast as possible. Um, from 1030 to 1115, it's going to be finding balance with the Anthony Harris again. And then 1115 to 1130, we should have uh, Linda Edwards with TRICARE. She's going to do a short brief, just kind of a brief overview of TRICARE. And then from 1130 to 12, VA is going to uh, come and answer any questions you might have, and then you guys will have a break. And then after lunch, Sergeant Major Shook is going to do an MRT, and then we'd really like you guys to have your family members uh, attend the IBHS. I sent out a Zoom link for that. That's going to be with Kevin Sears. He's going to go over the program, um, what the program can provide during your deployment and after your deployment. And then from roughly 1330 to 1500, there's going to be a long presentation with a question and answer on TRICARE. Uh, she's going to go through the whole life cycle of TRICARE, which are available to get now, how to get coverage, um, how your dependents get coverage, where they can go, any and all questions you have about TRICARE. Um, during this event, sometimes we've gone to a couple deployments before. We don't think this information really is beneficial to us. But if we're leaders, maybe the PFC below us and our squad is not really paying attention, and then they have questions, and you'll be able to answer that question because you pay attention now. Please ask questions on the Facebook page. I'm going to turn it over to Chaplain Watson for his invocation. Thank you, Sergeant Hill. Uh, I'm Chaplain Thomas Watson. I'm one of the senior chaplains with the North Carolina Army National Guard Chaplain Corps, and I'm delighted to be here with you this morning. If you would, would you open with me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father and most gracious God, we thank you for being our light and our salvation. For without you, we have nowhere to look, nowhere to step, and, and nothing to keep us from harm. So, Lord, we thank you. We invite you to be here this morning 
as we consider the things we ought to say to each other, um, the things that families need to talk about, the things that will bring us together as we think about separation for a short time and completing a mission together. Lord, I pray these things in your holy name. Amen. All right, we're going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Harris for address your stress. All right, let me see if I can um, <clears throat> share my screen here real quick. All right. Can somebody just let me know if we're tracking on that side, if we're good to go? That looks good, sir. All right. First and foremost, I want to say thank you all for all of your service. Uh, my name is DeAnthony Harris. Uh, just a quick introduction. I'm a, I'm a one of the cadre of speakers of uh, one of about 30 speakers that are allowed to to are just given this this unique privilege to come out and and be able to share and speak uh, very some some resiliency topics related to deployment reintegrations to family to service members um, of all different services. And so I, I really enjoy doing this. Um, I've been doing it now for about three years. I've also, I'm also a reservist myself. Uh, so I'm, I'm currently assigned to uh, the 36th Air and Medical Evacuation Squadron at Keesler Air Force Base. Um, I'm a captain, healthcare administrator. I'm a prior E. I was security forces um, way back in my younger days, my younger, I call them my, my crazy days. Um, and so I, I've been around for a while. This, I'm going into my 16th year um, in the military. Um, so my, my wife is also um, a nurse in the Air Force. And so a lot of these things that, that, I, that I'm gonna talk about today in the two sessions that I'm gonna offer is address your stress and finding balance. Y'all, this is just a way to, to really hone in just on some soft skills that could help you during um, a time of struggle. So um, I believe I have access to the Facebook um, live stream. I'm trying not to turn it on because I don't want to disrupt my mic, but I, I think I can see questions on there. And, and if I see anything on there, I, I can, I can, you know, ask them, answer them as I go. Um, if I can get some help from, you know, the, the other planners, uh, Mr. Uh, Sergeant Hill, if you see anything, you know, please feel free to bring it up. I'm flexible. Don't mind stopping and sharing um, if anything should come up. So I want to get started real quick by playing a little video. Um, Hopefully the volume is good on your side. If not, you know, I'll kind of talk through it as, as, if, if, if everybody can't hear it. So I'm going to try this out real quick. Here we go. Ms. G, can I read something from my diary? That'd be great. See, he's still with us freshman year, fool. What's that? The summer was the worst summer in my short 14 years of life. It all started with a phone call. My mother was crying and begging, asking for more time, as if she were gasping for her last breath of air. She helped me as tight as she could and cried. Her tears hit my shirt like bullets. Told me we were being evicted. She kept apologizing to me. I thought I have no home. I should have asked for something less expensive at Christmas. On the morning of the eviction, a hard knock on the door woke me up. The sheriff was there to do his job. I looked up by the sky, waiting for something to happen. My mother has no family to lean on, no money coming in. Why bother coming to school or getting good grades if I'm homeless? The bus stops in front of the school. I feel like throwing up. I'm wearing clothes from last year, some old shoes and only a haircut. I kept thinking I could laugh that. Instead, I'm greeted by a couple of friends who were in my English class last year. It hits me, Mrs. Gowa, my crazy English teacher from last year, is the only person that made me think of hope. Talking with friends about last year's English and our trips, I began to feel better. I received my schedule and the first teacher is Mrs. Gerwan, room 203. I walk into the 
room and feel as though all the problems in life are not so important anymore. I am proud. Okay. One of the reasons why I like to show that, I mean, I show that video, um, you see this kid, of course, who his life, as he is stating, is met with all kinds of adversity, all kinds of challenges, all kinds of struggles. And we get a chance to even just hear in his voice and in, in, his, in his story that he was telling, like, there have been some, some very difficult things going on in my life and in my world to the point that it caused me to, to start to lose hope and just wanting to continue to press on. Stress has a way of bringing that type of, of dynamic into our lives to where it can challenge us in so many different ways to where it could really start to, we start to see life in a very pessimistic way. I, and I know, you know, as, 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 as guardsmen, reservists, part-timers is what they call us. I don't believe that's so true anymore because I feel like I'm full-time, even though I'm only a reservist. Uh, but our, our lives are, are given to two worlds. We have the things that we are asked to do in our communities. We have those things that we're asked to do for the military. We have to be able to pick up within 24, 72, 48, 20, 72 hours to go down range, to come back, to reintegrate, not only with our families, but also within our communities, within our jobs. We have to work to make the military sometimes make sense to some of our bosses and people that are on our jobs. There's so many different levels. The military says, you know what? I'm going to stress your life in a way that is going to challenge you. But I also want to teach you and give you skills to help you cope during those times. So if you're on the Facebook Live, I, I want to know some of the ways. What are what are some of the ways that that you feel like you know your life has been stressed, or what are some of the stresses that you're currently experiencing? I know nationally we can see this in in terms of how we've been impacted by natural disasters earthquakes, pandemics, civil uproar, political issues within our communities and within our, and within our nation. We, we've seen stress not just on an individual level, on a national level, but we even see this happening on a global level. And it's being impacted with us in such a way. And so identifying stress then becomes so important. And I, and I wanna use that, the last phrase of what the young man stated in the video, that sense of I am home. Have you ever felt that you're, you were stressed so much that you just kind of got away from being your normal you? Somebody looked at you and asked you, hey, are you okay? Is everything going all right? Because you just didn't quite seem like yourself anymore. Well, we want to kind of talk about that because stress has a way of shifting us from our sense of balance, our place of I am home, to actually causing us to act in different ways. So asking yourself, as you as you think about this presentation, and, and, I, and I like what Sergeant Hill said, please, I've been to a ton of Yellow Ribbon events myself. I've spoke at several of them. I've taught Army, Marine Guards. I've sat through them. Please don't allow the information that you hear today become cliche, because you never know when that information, when, when it's going to, that point in your life is going to come to when you will be able to use that. And I always say, regardless of our age, our rank, our location, our favorite football teams, except for mine is Falcons, so I'm sure I tend to experience a little more stress than most in that area. But regardless of where we come from, everybody's life is going to be tested. Your sense of resiliency is going to be tested. Even if you're the service members that's going down range, or if you're that spouse or that significant other or that partner that is staying home, your life is going to, your sense of resiliency is going to be tested. And so all of the information that you're going to hear from these resource providers and these speakers today is going to be your way of fighting back. So asking yourself now, what causes stress in your life? And if you're willing to share that on the Facebook Live, please do so. Because one thing that's important is that, yes, you can learn from the speakers, but I think people learn more from each other. Somebody could be, somebody could see something that you say, and you're like, no, I really didn't think about that. But yeah, that, that is a, a bit of a stressor for me. But this is the place to talk about that so that we can try to address your stress, right? So what makes you feel off balance? How do you know you're stressed? And what do you do to cope to deal with stress? And so our, our objective today is pretty simple, folks. We're going to identify when stress impacts your well-being. We're going to try to distinguish between real and perceived stress. And we're going to, we're going to apply strategies and some techniques that I'm going to give you towards the end of the, um, the, the, the presentation 
in order to um, to deal to manage stress better. So stress is a response we have when life challenges seems greater than our ability to handle them. Everyone has a range of resiliency, meaning we were all born differently. Some people may be able to handle a, a weight, a load of, of tasks, responsibilities, and challenges, and other people may not have that type of capacity. I'm pretty sure you've worked with some to where they seem like they just get stressed very easily, but everyone has a range of resiliency and we're not all the same. But I don't think the military is technically asking, going around asking each one of you, hey, what's your range of resiliency? How much stress can you take? Well, how much stress can you take? How much stress can you take? I don't think that's the case. I think I think we the military tries very hard to to distribute it evenly as much as possible, right? So that you don't get as much stress as another group. Probably not. But here's the thing. Since we all have our own range of resiliency, then we all have the ability to cultivate uh, better ways to respond to stress. So knowing that it is a response we have when life challenges seem greater than our ability to handle them. And we see this sometimes. And, and, and sometimes you say, well, man, I, I, was, I was going about life and everything seemed really well. And then I saw those, the boom thing happens. Things that seem to just come out of nowhere. A spouse deploys and then the, the refrigerator breaks or children are having struggles and challenges in school and, and it just seems like things just kind of keep happening and piling on top of each other, right? And sometimes it is, we, we can break one easy way to, under, to start to understand and view stress is breaking it down between there's real stress, the things that just no kidding happen, like if it breaks, it breaks. Like I can't find my keys and I'm late. That's what it is. I'm stressed because I cannot find my keys. Or it could be perceived. It, it could just something that I'm, I'm, I'm viewing is not necessarily the reality of the situation, but it's just something that's in my mind. Like my husband is five minutes late. What if he was in a bad car accident? That's a, a perceived stress. So how much, how much do you see in your life as being perceived? How often do you perceive things like I just think it and then I suddenly just become stressed about it. Usually you can find those perceived stressors around 11, 12 o'clock at night when you're laying in bed and you just pop up and you just cannot go back to sleep because you got thoughts that are just like a freight train. They're just running, right? So if we were all together, I would definitely have you all go through these, but I'll talk through them right now. So my boss wants their, this report completed tomorrow. And there's no way I'm going to get it. I'm, there's no way to do it. Is that a real or is that a perceived stressor? Just think to yourselves. Or if you dare, go ahead and drop it on the Facebook Live and just, and just guess what it is. My boss wants this report completed tomorrow. There's no way to do it. That could be a real stressor. Something could be down, uh, there may be no way to send it. Outlook could be down. It could be a real stressor. If there's absolutely no way to get it done, then, then I just can't do it. I don't think my mother-in-law likes me, real or perceived. Well, I mean, it could be real, possibly, but in, in, in this example, it is a perceived stressor because it says, I don't think. Some people say, I know my mother-in-law doesn't like me and I have evidence. And, and, and if you dare to share any stories about that, I, I like to hear those too, actually. On, on what exactly did she do or tell you that made you think that she doesn't like you? But so there is an official letter from the bank. What am I going to do? I must have overdrawn my checking account. Do you see how these perceived stresses are kind of speculative? They're not quite concrete. They're not quite saying this, this is it. It says, I must have, I think, um, I, I feel like that is a perceived stressor. I didn't plan on the water heater breaking. How am I going to pay for it? That's a real stressor. The doctor hasn't called. My test results must be positive. That is also a perceived stressor. So 
learning to um to think about stress in terms of like is this real no kidding is this like something that is really tangible like really happening or is this just something that that i'm perceiving it is is it what if is it i think is it possible is it this must have or might be if you find yourself thinking along those lines it is likely that that is a perceived stressor some stress is actually good for us though too much stress is a different matter. Some stress is good for us, not stress that stress can cause you to, to get on task. You know, you might have a paper due and, or you might have a um, evaluation that you got to get done or you might have to, you know, you know, you have a, a, a deadline for like for your pre-mobilization. You got things that you got to do. And yes, it creates stress, but it is creating stress in terms of motivating you, not debilitating you. How often have you just felt completely debilitated by stress once you get to that point to where stress makes you want to stop it is working against you instead of for you when stress is causing me to want to stop stress physiologically is designed to keep me going forward but there are times where it becomes bad stress the person believes the stressor is significant for his or her well-being the person believes the stressor is significant for his or her well-being. And the person believes the stressor is bigger than his or her ability to deal with it. And at this point, that's when stress starts, as I stated before, it starts to become somewhat debilitating or even crippling. Yeah, it becomes, it starts to kind of work on my self-esteem a little bit when it becomes bad stress. Is stress a, and here are some questions to ask. How do I know that I'm dealing with bad stress? Stress conditions. Well, do I care? Here, here are the, is the stress relevant to my well-being? You know, is this something that I am, if I, I, if, is this something that if I don't deal with it now, you know, can I let it go? On a scale of one to 10, 10 being the absolute worst, how important is this stressor? Does the stressor block or enhance my personal goals? Does the stressor impact my self-esteem, my morals, my values? These are all really, really good questions to ask whenever you're dealing with stressor. Because it gives you a chance to assess whether or not this is something that I know kidding need to be focused on. You won't believe how many people I've seen it. And I can take my family, for example, I'm from a very small town in Georgia. That's where I am. I live in Georgia, a small town called Marshallville, Georgia, and it's very, very tiny. Uh, but what you see people that um, they folks, they hold on to stresses for so long. There was a guy named Sapolsky who wrote a book. I'll show y'all tell y'all a quick story. Sapolsky, he wrote a wrote a book called Why Why Don't Zebras Get Ulcers? An interesting book. If you in the, if you really want to get more into the physiological effects of stress, I recommend you 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 check out this book. Um, and, and what Sapolsky talked about in this book was, was basically, imagine a zebra, if you will, sitting on a, a safari, and then a lion comes out and tries to uh, attack this zebra. Well, the zebra is going to go through all of the normal physiological things that people go through or animals go through when they're trying, when they're being attacked, or they're trying to get out of the harm's way of, get out of the way of danger, right? The heart rates are going to elevate. Their, their, their veins are going to start to, to, to extract and, and constrict. They're going to, they're, they're, they're going to, their, their mind is going to start shutting down really rational parts of the brain that's not necessarily needed because all the only thing the brain needs to do is get out of the way. They're going to start secreting all of those stress hormones, cortisol, epinephrine, neuroepinephrine, glucocorticoids, their, their mind, their body is going to start to work for them. Stress is going to work for them because there is a goal. That means we need you to get out of the way of this danger, right? And let's say that zebra managed to escape and he gets out of the way and he 40, 30, 40 minutes later, that zebra goes back to his normal I'm home state, his normal him, a relaxed state, state of peace, of serenity. But this, this, this scientist said that as humans, we activate the same stress so we activate the same stress system and there's no lion really present. We can do it with a thought. You can activate the same level of stress response sitting at your home right now. Some, when you got up this morning and you realize, you know, man, I got to log on to this Yellow Ribbon event. It's Sunday morning. You just activated the same stress response system. 
And that stress response system comes from a thought. A thought that you have in your mind that activates the stress response systems that cause the same thing to happen in your body physiologically that's happening with the zebra that is trying to escape. And we don't do it just for one day. Some of us don't do it and we don't we don't get stressed and go back to our normal state. We remain that way for hours, for days, for months, for years. Just ask yourself, is there a stressor, a thought that you've had in your mind that you have maintained for a long time? Because if you have the body, the body, oh, I read a book also said that the body will keep the score. The body will tell the story of what's happening in the mind. And for some of you, that's that's just a, a question that you have to ask yourself. So knowing that the stress response involves multiple responses in the body, our body changes when we're exposed to ongoing stresses that we do not think we can handle. And when it gets to this point, we have to start assessing this. Do I care about the stress? Because sometimes, yeah, it might be my children. It might be my son. And I care about him, so it causes me stress. It might be my job that I care about. So yes, it, it is causing me stress. And learn to understand, does the stress of block or enhance my personal goals or my views or my values? And if so, I have to really start chipping away and breaking this down so that I could do better at it. For example, here's an example. If you have a fear of speaking in front of others, your body sets off a chain of reactions, right? Your breathing may increase, your heart rate may increase, and your palms may sweat, right? Here comes the lion. Lion is there. The lion is, has now become this audience of people that I, I just do not want to speak in front of, and it has activated all of my stress response system. You may even feel a sense of danger, yeah? And this sense of fear is your nervous system, right? Reacting to stress. And stress also turns off the bodily processes that helps us relax and feel calm. Meaning I, there's no really way I can go back to that. But what the science has also you know, added was that, hey, the more elevated I maintain my heart rate because of stressful thoughts, the more stress hormones remain in my body. And the more stress hormones remain in my body, the less likely I, I decrease my chances of truly returning to a, a, a balance within myself. And so this is something I say all of this to say, hey, this is why it is important to kind of lean your ear towards these these type briefings and resources so that we can manage stress a lot better. Because it affects my immune system, prolonged stress, real or perceived. Even if it's perceived, even if it's something that I'm just kind of like thinking about in my mind or just worried about in my mind, it doesn't matter. It still affects the body the same way. And repeated exposure to stress makes us more vulnerable to colds to flu, and to other sicknesses. There have even been research that said that, hey, that repeated response to stress ha had also contributed to uh, pneumonia and other type of, of, um, of, 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 of coughs and disease. It, it also diminishes our energy. And under stress, our concentration is limited, our focus. We are more likely to have negative moods and our daily chores may seem more difficult to handle. So folks, why is this so important in terms of reintegration of Yellow Ribbon? Because there's already some real stressors that are taking place. And that's just simply having to, to be mobilized and having to shift from one place in your lives and in your communities to a whole nother place. But consider doing this with other stressors already piled on top of that. And so you, all of these people are going to come in here today, like TRICARE, I'm sure. They're all here to help remove some of these other stressors so that you can focus on the mission, the mission downrange and the mission at home. So one approach for, for, for um, so how long has the stress been with me? That's, that's a, all of these are really good questions to answer, please. And I hope you kind of maybe even take a screenshot of this and just kind of do a little stress work on your own when you get a chance. So as we talked about this already, here's that stress response system. You see it exposure to stressors, stressors relevant to our well-being, because if it's not relevant to my well-being somehow, then it's, you can easily dismiss it. So ask yourself, whenever you feel that stressful thought, somehow this has become a, a lion to me. It's threatening me in some way, whether that's psychological, psychologically, physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually, something is threatening me. And I have to figure out, well, what that is. It could even be my career. It could be my children, my family, or my beliefs, or my values that we might experience stress about. 
Belief that stressors will harm and threaten us, exactly. Belief we can handle stressors last over time. You know, I'm from Georgia, and so in, in college football, we are strong competitors with um, Alabama. We might even have some Alabama uh, Nick Saban fans on, on, on the, uh, out there in the Facebook world. But no matter how good Georgia plays and how well they're playing, like last night we were, we were playing a pretty good game against South Carolina, but I'm still sitting there with Alabama, like in the back of my mind, that causes me stress because, like, yeah, it doesn't matter how good we're doing it. There's still the threat of saving down there, like that's gonna prevent me or prevent us from getting that national title. So it could, it could, it could even be a thought that we could maintain that could prevent us from being truly resilient in our lives. So we talked about this a little bit. We talked about the a sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, the sympathetic, of course, is, hey, something's happening. I'm threat. I'm, I'm feeling threatened. I got to move. I got to run. I, I got to get away. Yep. We read you loud and clear, sir. I got to run. I got to get away. Something's going on and it's activating all of those. And, and, and I want you to just imagine, if you will, like that's that could just be one simple thought that's causing me to be to be to be activated to that level. And so that typically causes us to just rev it up you know, in our mindset. And, and sometimes it's very difficult to bring that back down. And it's stress hormones in the body that causes us to stay up there. And also, I'll just tell you that the more stress hormones that live in our body, just from these thoughts, when our brain decides, hey, we want to we wanna add all of this to you, it causes us to want to do things. It, it causes us to burn energy. Because whenever you activate that level of stress hormones, your body is using energy to do it. And so what you want to do from that point is, well, you know, wow, I've, I've just burned all of this energy because I felt so stressed. And now if you're like me, you start turning towards food like, oh, man, I want to go eat chocolate or I want to go eat this or drink energy drinks or more coffee and stuff. But, but really and truly, it's, it's, it's my body's way of responding to a loss of energy from having to deal with the stressful thoughts or perceived thoughts that are in my mind. Parasympathetic is where we want to, it's, it's that, it's the part of our nervous system that's helped brings us back to I am home, kind of using the paradigm from the video earlier, to bring us back into homeostasis, to balance as we shift from these different places in our minds and, and, and in our worlds, right? So breathe in the parasympathetic nervous system, rest, of course, and digest. This, this is using the breath to help bring us back to, to this state is, is, is necessary because once we have activated that nervous system and we're elevated, it's very, your body's not thinking about resting and digesting, it's thinking about surviving. But when we breathe and we tap into our parasympathetic nervous system, that's the calming part of a who we are. And this goes away because if, if we're being threatened and threatened by something, you don't need your parasympathetic. Now, you don't want it. Cause you don't want to, you know, be calm and you don't want to bond or you don't want to, you know, pull out a cup of tea and just sit and enjoy the sunrise whenever something's chasing you. So breathing becomes slow and relaxed whenever we're tapping into that parasympathetic nervous system. Breathe, breath shifts from chest to the abdomen whenever we're tapping into that system. So I want you, if you have, I want you to, if, you, if you're on the live and, and you got, if you can, like drop some ways that you currently manage stress or handle stress um things that you do currently um and hopefully those things are a lot better than than what this gentleman does Yeah, I, I definitely hope your your stress management skills are a little better than that. But hey, 
if it works, it works. Here's some examples, stress busting strategies. Journal about your stress and worry. I know some people just kind of like frown upon journaling, um, but journaling helps in, in, in a couple of different ways. But one thing, journaling gives you a chance to assess your own thoughts throughout your day or even throughout your week. You know, what was like really, like really big and just like a, a, a lion in the morning, it may be a little bit less than that in the evening. And it also gives you a chance to say, hey, I was extremely worried about, you know, this particular situation in the morning. And I was just stressing like, man, my, my, my kid had a test today and I don't know how you're going to do. But I was just really stressing about that in the morning because I wanted him to be successful. And then the evening he comes back and say, yeah, I made an A. And then you can kind of ask, you can kind of look at, go back and look at how much energy you was putting towards that, you know, in the AM. And instead of like, man, maybe I, maybe I could, you know, relax that to maybe about five or four or five from now on and just kind of have a little bit more trust and faith in, in, you know, in my kid or even in my spouse, you know, like, man, you know, what stressed you out today? I asked my spouse to do something for me and they didn't take care of it. And then they came home and without even, you know, asking them, they came right home after work and they took care of that, you know, the issue. And they just said, well, I couldn't get to it this morning because I was running a little bit behind. Not that you were being ignored. So as a, as a therapist and I've worked in, in private practice for a while, I always recommend journaling to, to my clients um, because I feel like it's so important to help create a, a, a tracking mechanism for just how we process things on a regular basis. And most people would tell me that, hey, I would go back and I look at, you know, some of the thoughts that I've had. And then once you see like how those situations actually turned out and oftentimes those situations turned out for the better or even better than that person had thought, they're able to kind of like give themselves a little bit more grace and kind of a break in the future whenever they see those same thoughts. So journaling about your stress and worry. And also, 50, I, I know you've heard probably heard this said that most of the things that we worry about never even really come true. But again, remember, your body is going to react the same way whether it's real or whether it's perceived. And a lot of perceived stress comes in the form of worry. And those things never, even though they never come to fruition, your body still takes the impact of those type of thoughts. So, you know, journaling allows you to say, hey, you know, maybe I can kind of release this one and let this one go a little bit. So also limit worry to a specific time of the day. You know, even, even when, you know what, I got, is a, when there's a lot going on and I can just kind of, you know, stay focused and get through what I need to get through. There's a time where I would just kind of sit down and just let my, just give myself an opportunity to just cycle through my, my feelings and my worry. Like, man, these are all of the things that I'm worried about. You know, and I'm just going to kind of put them all here in this moment and then I'm going to set them aside and I'm going to keep pressing. You know, and while, you know, ideally we wouldn't worry at all, that's just not the case because we're human and there are too many uncertainties as in the next title in life. Because we can't, if we can control our kids, if we can control schools, we can control our sports teams, our football teams and baseball teams. If we can control the world and politicians and everybody, we probably wouldn't be as stressed and worried as we often are. But the fact that we cannot do those things, it creates this thing called uncertainty in some areas. So how do we learn to tolerate and cultivate a capacity to tolerate uncertainty? Well, you, you, you do so um, by kind of releasing, being able to release the areas where I can, I, I may be, here are the things that I can't control, but here are the things that I can't. One of my favorite, um, he was a psychiatrist, a neuropsychiatrist, philosopher. His name is Viktor Frankl. He wrote a book called A Man's Search for Meaning. And he was um, he was a prisoner in, in, in the Holocaust, during the Holocaust camp. But he was a very brilliant man. He had everything taken from him. His life was just turned upside down because he went from being this really, you know, popular psychiatrist or neuropsychiatrist. And, um, um, or, and, and he ended up... And, you know, it, of course, in Hitler's concentration camp, and he lost his family, his children, his job, his career, everything. But he, he, Victor Frankl wrote that, hey, you may not be able to control the circumstances in your life, as we have seen with COVID-19. That, no, we can't control these numbers, or we can't control the different or people's decisions to take the shot, to not take the shot, to do these. We, we don't have any control over all of the things that are going on around us. 
but we always have control over how we respond to those things. And we can respond to those things in a way that that releases some of the stress and some of the control of not being able to see it. And sometimes that just simply comes with identifying where that line is. Well, where is that line of, of demarcation? Um, what we used to call in security in my security forces world, that line where you just don't cross it. You know, I, this is where I stop because if I go beyond that, it's going to throw me into a sea of uncertainty and worry. And, I, and right here, I still have control over who I am. And learning to focus on the present. Um, a lot of people that I have treated for anxiety um, and, and also depression, I, I, you know, a very non-clinical way that I've seen depression and anxiety manifest is that depression is this, 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 this focus on, you know, issues in the past and, and anxiety seem very focused on uncertainties in the future. And so learning to focus on the present, you know, what's, what's happening right here and right now. How am I breathing? How am I sitting? What is my body language saying? And what is my body language communicating? You know, how am I communicating with the people that are around me? You know, what's happening right now? It is a great question to ask whenever we're trying to, to get people grounded that are having a panic attack or anxiety attack. Hey, what is happening right now? Because somehow I've allowed my, my survival brain to, to get like all the way into the future. And we have to kind of what bring it back to I am home, bring it back to the present, right? Learning to do a physical activity, you know, and believe it or not, physical activities are really great for releasing those stress hormones that we tend to gather up in our body. That's the reason why if you, if you just had like a stressful day of work and you go out and go for a run and you feel this, this feel good sensation, because that is your body way of dumping those horm those stress hormones that are accumulated from the thoughts that we have throughout the day. Talking to a friend and make sure you talk to a friend that won't cause you more stress. I talked to a friend of mine and, and it seems like when I'm talking to him, it's just he's busy trying to one up me. And I'm like, you're so focused on one up me that you can't even listen to my 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 stress. You know, if I tell you I have a headache, then he has a migraine. You know, if I say, well, I have the flu and he has pneumonia, you know, and I'm just like, my goodness, like you, that's his way of, of helping me by saying my, my issues are always worse than yours. So you shouldn't be that. It's like, no, no, that doesn't work. Talk to somebody that could be, that could just give you a listening ear and, and that could be empathetic towards your, towards your needs. Learning to slow down your breathing. Take time to, to, to breathe into the abdomen versus chest breathing. You won't believe how much people breathe out of their chest throughout the day because we're so always on alert and so vigilant that we spend a lot of time breathing from the chest and from the abdomen, meaning we don't get the full breath um, that we have because we're always on the go. And if you've noticed, we breathe less whenever the moment we become stressed, that's when our breathings get short. And so learning to really pay attention to that, even you know within your bodies, you know, how do I know that I'm stressed? Well, my breathing is, is getting really short um, and learning to relax your body. Guided imagery works wonders. I don't know if you had a chance to do it. We won't do it on this one, but imagine imagination. Um, of course, Albert Einstein said is more powerful than knowledge. I agree with that. However, I do think that it could also work against you because there's some things that you can imagine right now that could create all kind of panic and worry in you. So if you're imagining in a way like this picture, of, of, a, of a nice, you know, white sand beach and, and an umbrella and, and a nice ocean breeze. If your imagining is that way, go for it. Because yes, it, just like I can perceive things and become stressed, I can also imagine things and become relaxed. So we can, we can train our brains to, to, be, to do it both ways. So typically you would do that by finding a comfortable position and relax and concentrating on breathing and keep an open attitude, of course, and picking, and also try to pick a visual theme, like a beach or a forest or something that, that you associate with, this is my happy place, this is my relaxed place, you know, and allow your mind to just develop that image as best you can. They say in your mind's eye, just allow that image to develop and then use all your senses, open up your ears to hearing things and open up your, your nose to actually smelling things that are around you and, Open up your, your physical sensations to feeling things that are around you, like the seat that you're in. Things that when we're so caught up in our brains, we never really pay attention to. I was 
going for a walk outside one day and it, it was just really strange because I'm so I'm, a, I'm that kind of person that could drive to work and I'm so focused on all of the different tasks that I have to do that I completely didn't pay attention to how I got from point A to point B. I just ended up there. Um, that's me because I can get into my thoughts that way. But I was walking outside one day and, and I just kind of noticed. I just listened to, you know, I heard a bird chirping. And then I said, well, I, I heard one bird. And then I kind of focused on that bird. And then next thing you know, I heard like a ton of them chirping. I'm just like, where did all these birds come from? Yes, like you could be so caught up in your thoughts that you can tune out the rest of life that's going on around you. You can tune out, you can even tune out your children. You can tune out your, your, your significant others, your spouses, because of this just keeps going, right? Unintentionally done, however, it, 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 it definitely happens. Um, so learning to counter negative thoughts, folks, here, here are just some, some what we call cognitive traps. These are places that we typically go in our minds whenever, whenever we are experiencing stress. Or oh, you can find, I would say, you can find stressful thoughts generating out of these types of thinking, all or nothing, looking at things only black and white. You know, the, the, these are all examples of, of how to. Dis Here's an example. Um, John, like for example, John met Susan casually at a friend's party. He thought that they had a good time, right? So he called her, but he got her voicemail. So he left a message for Susan, but did not uh, hear back from her. He begins to think that things must not have gone well at the party. John thinks, I am a failure. I have nothing to offer Susan or anybody else. That's all or nothing thinking. <clears throat> and sometimes, and it doesn't have to be, of course, dating, but we get, we can get into this cognitive trap and these are ways that it, it, it starts to pr produce those stressful thoughts, right? Overgeneralization, expecting one negative experience to hold over to hold to hold over forever. Let me give you an example of that. John thinks that because Susan did not call him back, right? She does not want to go out with him. Therefore, John thinks no one ever wants to go out with me. Do you use ever in your conversation and with your family? Ever, ever, never, those words. Bad juju. No one ever wants to go out with me. I would never find the right person, so why bother? But you start to overgeneralize things, you're using those words, never, ever, all of that good stuff. So, you know, that was his way of pretty much overgeneralizing. Because of this one experience, now he's generalized this to everybody in the world. All of the, 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 the dating, the females that are out there, or whatever, he's generalizing this whole thing. Diminishing the positive, not counting positive experiences, right? Um, so Susan finally does call John and she tells John that she was out of town for a few days because she recently got a job promotion at work and John immediately congratulates her. And Susan tells John, it was nothing. I just, I just got lucky, right? John, you know, Susan is now kind of the one that is, she diminishes the positive things that are happening in her life. And when, whenever we experience like a lot of stress and a lot of negativity, notice that when people are really stressed out, it's very difficult for them to hear positive affirmation. And, and so that that becomes something because, because once they get stuck in the negative, right? They When, when we're stuck in the negative, it's, it's those stressful thoughts kind of cater to that. So it becomes difficult to hear positive. So we find ourselves diminishing the positive. So as you're going about, you know, your, your deployments and you're going about altering and adjusting your lives and your worlds to, to accommodate this, and, and, and not to mention all of the other different things that are happening in our world today. Ask yourself, you know, are you diminished? What are the positive things that are happening in your world? And how can you give those things a little bit more attention and a little bit more focus, even in the midst of a lot of stressful situations? You know, what, what positive things are you seeing? And I know when you turn on the news, sometimes it, it seems like there's very little positivity that comes from, you know, things that are going on around us, because a lot of us tends to focus on some of the very negative aspects. And, and we could get caught up in that type of thinking, but I want you to, to, to add, to try to see, you know, what positive things are, are actually happening. And if you do have some stories, hey, drop those in the chat too. So jumping to conclusion is when we make a few quick conclusions without considering evidence. So for example, John jumped to conclusion when Susan did not call him back right away. John thought Susan hasn't called him back. She must not like me, right? Sometimes we do that, making negative interpretations without any evidence. When you have those stressful thoughts, 
is there any evidence that this thought is even true or is this just something I'm perceiving? Is there evidence? Because once again, what we're doing, folks, is we're fighting for our bodies. We're fighting for our health and we're fighting for our free space to just be calm and relax whenever we're combating these thoughts. And, and it's almost like I tell my kids who, who um, I work with a lot of Asperger's and ADHD, I call them ants, you know, automatic negative thoughts, you know, and you see where the ants kind of come marching in when you see one little ant attracted to like one sugar or one little negative, and imagine that little piece of candy is a negative thought. Next thing you know, you look back and it is surrounded by ants, automatic negative thoughts. And so when one comes, two comes, three comes, four comes. And so learning, how to combat those so that it doesn't become a chain, chain of thoughts. Um, catastrophizing is, is a negative thinking that involves expecting the worst case scenario. For instance, Susan thinks I miss John's call. He'll never take me on a date now. Expecting the worst case scenario. My mother did this once. My, my younger brother um, is in the Navy. And of course, we both were out somewhere. And I think my brother was on like a, a, a world tour and I was... I was in Europe somewhere and, you know, my mom, she's not very military, so she don't know a whole lot. And my brother's a lot younger. It's first time going out and deploying. And she goes, well, isn't there like something against this rule where two brothers can't be out at the same time? Like, well, I don't, that, that was like, you know, like probably way back in the day. I don't even know if that's true now. And so she was just really stressed and expecting like, wow, well, what happens if something happens to both of y'all while y'all are out there? Like, somebody, you seriously catastrophize this. Plus my little brother was in like, some of the most beautiful places. And I said, look at his Facebook page. Like right now he's on Facebook in like somewhere that I would love to be. And he's taking pictures, he's eating food. He's he's on like, he was on um, Yelp giving reviews and everything. Like he, I'm like, he, he, I don't think this is that kind of party. Maybe when Save It Private Ryan's come, which he probably watched a show like that and got those ideas came through. Yeah, but not now. So moving on, should or shouldn't, holding strict standards that no one could live up to. Um, and folks, as, as Sergeant Hill had mentioned earlier, you know, if you feel like this, it may be not for you also, I mean, consider those people that you're, that you, that work for you, consider those people that are under your leadership, you know, um, holding strict standards that no one can live up to. Uh, these types of thoughts often make you feel guilty. For example, uh, Susan thinks I should have called John back right after I heard his voicemail. Um, you know, recognizing that, everybody needs just a little bit of grace in terms of growing and learning. You know, I've had several, you know, younger troops that have worked for me. I, and because I've been a younger troop, that crazy troop that was late, that didn't shave, that didn't turn in his gear on time and didn't do, I've been that person, you know, I, and we have to be careful how we allow our values to turn into shoulds for other people. Like my values become your shoulds. And whenever we find ourselves in that place, it creates stress for us. In that, and as you see, even with, you know, um, some of the older guys that I hang around, they their values and how they was raised. And back in the day when we did this and we did this, now these younger folks should. And now that we have so many different generations in the workplace, you see this even more. And so just being mindful of how my values become other people should. Um, and, 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 and caution and just cautioning that not that my values can inform me on how to best lead and guide people, but it becomes stressful when it, because it becomes somewhat like, man, this has to be this way. And I have to see life this way. So labeling yourself based on perceived shortcomings. Um, here's a quick example of that. That's kind of our self perceived shortcomings, calling yourself a loser, calling yourself stupid. I think I'm such a loser. The Wanda Susan doesn't you know, no wonder she didn't call me back, you know, labeling yourself because of just personal setbacks. And um, I, I've seen this happen too. Uh, when, when, and I, I see this a lot too with the people, uh, some of my, the guys that I've worked with with post traumatic stress. This is, this is a huge challenge. I, they start to label themselves based on experiences that they've had. Um, so personalization, taking responsibilities for things you do not control. Um, and and that, that's another example. So, all of these are really, really just kind of great uh, things to focus on to, to help combat some of the negative things and keeping a thought record, you know, and we kind of talked about this earlier with journaling, so I won't harp on it, but just being able to identify what, what was I thinking? What was the situation? What was the thought? And what did I rate that? Uh, kind of worried, pretty worried, very worried. If you are a worrier, this is, this is gold for you. 
because and then if you can identify like what type of thought that was like catastrophe catastrophe personalization you know uh like for example with my mother it would have been situation both sons are deployed you know what's the stressful thoughts you know both of them won't return uh that's a catastrophe and she's worried at an eight but when she sees my brother's facebook page and that he is doing very fine and then actually enjoying himself then that worry probably becomes and if she would have seen when i was in europe she probably would have been worried a little less too and so it would have probably become more like a two or three versus a eight or nine right so learn about your thoughts learn when you worry and what you focus what is my focus what is the focus of my worry are there things what's going on when i worry who is around when i worry what do i get out of worrying because whether we believe it or not, worrying has a goal. Um, one lady that I worked with, um, her she's a military spouse and her husband was deployed and her son was diagnosed with a, a very rare disease. Um, uh, very almost, I think, very rare disease. And, and she worries all the time. And she says she worries because she doesn't want to be caught off guard. And so she learned that her worry has a, has a, 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 a purpose. And, and that is I won't be caught off guard by anything that might come up. So learning what, what, what do I get out of worry? And what am I predicting will happen? Okay. These are just some ways to kind of again track track those, get more specific with those thoughts and a little bit more focus on them. Um, same thing as a thought journal. And so that's that's address your stress, folks. I, I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, our objectives was simply to identify when stress impacts your well-being, to distinguish between real and perceived stress, and apply strategies and techniques to address your stress. Um, so that is address your stress. I, I'll Stand by if anyone had any questions or anything came up. If not, we'll turn it back over to the coordinator and we'll keep pressing with this event. Thank you so much. Staff Sergeant Hill, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to roll right into the next group. Uh, we're going to start with Child and Youth with Christy Wagner. Let me get that PowerPoint up. Good morning. My name is Christy Wagner and I'm the lead child health coordinator for the North Carolina National Guard. Um, I'm here to present um, information to help you if you have children um, in the Guard and with resources that will benefit you. Next. Our mission is to promote the sustain and sustain quality of life and resilience of the North Carolina National Guard children by providing secure, timely, flexible, highly high quality support services and enrichment programs. We do that through education, access, opportunity, communication, resilience, and outreach. Next. Our National Guard has a teen council. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but we do meet once a month during the school year from September through May. Um, we currently meet in Raleigh and in Charlotte, but if you're not in those locations, we offer a virtual um, call-in program where you can be part of teen council no matter where you are. And we would like a um, better representation of teens across our state and the issues that they're facing, especially in the rural areas where they don't have as many support systems. We also offer new parent packets. Um, it's a large packet of all kinds of valuable resources and some fun giveaways. Um, that we've put together. We work with Project Linus to provide um, baby blankets and different stuff like that, but it, it gives you all the information you need, especially during deployment if you're expecting Project on Linus what you need to do, to get Red Cross messages out, like that, as well as um, how to get your kid enrolled in years and, and such if they're born um, during deployment. We do offer a National Guard youth camp and teen leadership retreat. Um, they are for specific ages. So youth camp is for six to 13 year olds and teen retreat is for 14 up through high school senior. Um, these camps are provided for free um, through the National Guard Child Youth Program and your children are eligible for them no matter 
what deployment cycle they're in. Um, all child and youth programming is for every unit, um, no matter where you're located. Next. Operation Kids on Guard was a nonprofit and still is that supports the child and youth programming. This allows us to have a greater diversity in the types of programming we can offer. Um, we like to offer some parent child opportunities through this. Um, it doesn't have as many restrictions as our federal budget does. So we're allowed to open it up to um, military geographically dispersed kids across the state. Next. Next slide, please. So the NC Pre-K program, um, formerly known as More at Four, is an opportunity for National Guard children who are about to be four um, during this deployment cycle to take part in the Pre-K program. Um, they feel that deployment cycles affect children's growth and so that makes them eligible to be part of the program. It does not give you um, an automatic in, especially if your program in your county um, has a wait list. So if you're going to be part of this, you do not need to, um, you don't need to base it on, you need to go ahead and apply for it if, it's, if it falls in your time frame. Um, as far as the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, we work with them very closely. If you run into any issues with your children missing school for a deployment event, um, or having problems with um, teachers or counselors understanding the deployment cycle, we recommend that you definitely let your school know that your children are going through this process. But if you run into any issues, we can help provide you with school absentee letters um, for um, deployment events and such like that. Next, please. Um, Army fee assistance is something that's provided to all full-time active duty AGR and technician positions, but because of deployment, you guys are eligible for that program. So if you need assistance um, with child care, um, subsidies while they're deployed because the spouse has had to go back to work or what have you. Um, that program is available to you during the deployment cycle. Um, other programs that are available are also the YMCA, and that program offers free membership um, during deployment. Um, there are some paper forms that you have to fill out to apply for that, and each YMCA is independently owned. Um, so it would be up to that YMCA on how they were going to um, process that. The Boys and Girls Club is a free membership all the time. That does not is not based on deployment cycle, um, but you can get a free membership to your Boys and Girls Club. These um, military memberships do not include any special class fees. So if swimming lessons is an extra fee um, on top of being part of the club, then you would have to pay that additional fee. Our Military Kids is a grant program that I want you guys to all take advantage of if you have children. They provide free $300 grants um, per child um, for extracurricular activities, and it can range anything from dance to um, sports classes to tutoring. I've had people use it for driver's ed, um, as well as, um, but that program is up to $300 per child ages three to 17. And if the program only costs, if you have your kids in two activities and one's 200 and one's 250, obviously you're gonna apply for the one that's more expensive because it's a one-time grant per child. So take advantage of that. Um, make sure if they're in dance class or whatever, when they write up the cost that they include any additional fees for costumes and things like that so that you can take full advantage of that $300. Next, tutor.com. Currently, because of COVID and a lot of online schooling is available to everyone, whether you're deployed or not, but that has free online tutoring. It is a great program. I took advantage of it when my children got up into higher math classes and I really didn't know how to help them. Um, they connect them with a virtual tutor based on their 
state and county that they live in and their um, curriculum. So it's a great program to take advantage of, as well as e-knowledge. If um, your kids are up in high school and they're getting ready to take all those um, SAT and ACT tests, um, the NFL works with e-knowledge to provide this programming to us. It's a valued between $350 and $1,500. And I think the max program right now only will cost you about $49 um, for that full $1,500 package. Um, Operation Purple and Camp Corral are camps that are offered for military. They are open to all branches of military service, but we suggest that you, if you're interested in your kids going to camp next summer, you need to get on their email list because those camps fill up very quickly and they usually open camp registration around the end of January through the beginning of March is when registration usually opens for those two camps. So I would um, get on their email list so that you know as soon as camps open. So essentially through this deployment, you could um, put your kids in three weeks of camp next summer. United Through Reading used to be a program that was only available at like USOs overseas to um, read books to your children. They have a new app and they are opening that up for all time. And you can download their app and you can receive books for your children and the service member can read them to them um, anytime and they can connect that way. Military Kids Connect is a program for children. It's divided by age groups. It is um, very highly um, monitored. Your kids are connected to only kids in their own age group. There's a lot of fun games and things there, but it gives them the opportunity to meet other kids their same age going through the same cycles of deployment um, for support. Um, North Carolina 4-H Youth Futures College Within Reach program is a mentoring program that um, our 4-H through NC State wrote a specific grant to support military connected students within our state. They are matched with a mentor um, that helps them work through like college career prep stuff, set their goals and things like that. Um, and they can start in that program when they're 12 and continue on it year after year as long as it's available. The Exceptional Family Member Program is a, fam is a program that is available to you through during deployment if you have a special needs family member, um, adult or child. Um, zero to Three has a lot of great resources for kids um, up into kindergarten. I know it's called Zero to Three, but their programming kind of goes through um, pre-K as well. So they have a lot of resources. They have a lot of um, things that you can download and, and do. MSEC as well is another educational program. They have a lot of webinars that I would highly suggest um, that help with different types of parenting skills, getting through the process. They also have you know, educational programs for you know, um, spouses trying to go back to work and things like that. The Tar Heel Challenge Program is a program for um, teens that are having trouble. Um, that is a military type schooling program for high school kids. You have to be 16 to um, participate in that. Um, Anchor for Life has deployment cycle kits that you can go on and order. And they have different stages of from pre-mobe to during sustainment type activities and also reunion packets. Like I said before, Teen Council meets um, September through May. We just had our first meeting and are getting ready for our Teen Council to participate in assisting with our um, Boo Bash at Joint Force Headquarters. All events are open to any, um, any unit across the state that Child and Youth offers at no cost to you. Um, like I said before, we do all kinds of events. Teen dating violence is a big one for us. We usually do that at the end of January. Um, and we've got a lot of great feedback from our teens and, and to continue that program in working with our SHARP on that. Continue. Here is all of our contact information. 
I would ask you if you haven't participated in programming to please do the needs assessment so we can see what we're missing um, and need to improve to get your kids involved in programming. If you have been in, in programming, please do the soldier parent satisfaction survey. If um, you're looking for additional resources, we have a um, Army National Guard Child and Youth Services um, app and Facebook. Um, our family programs Facebook, we post a lot of different events as they come up across the state. So please like that page so that you can see things as soon as um, Eventbrite registration opens for different events. And if your kids are apprehensive about attending something or you're just curious about the programs we do, please check out our Flickr page because there's a lot of pictures of post um, yellow ribbon events, camps, um, day activities and family fun days that we've done so that um, you can get a better idea of how we support our, your National Guard children. Next. There is our contact information. Um, I'm Christy Wagner again, and Carla Esworthy um, works with me at Joint Force Headquarters. And we have a new addition, Amanda Cool, who is um, stationed at the Charlotte Armory. So we're trying to spread our resources and our activities across the state. So please, um, any suggestions that you have to improve programming or if you're looking for activities in your area, please let us know. In addition, because we had to do this um, yellow ribbon virtually, if you're interested in receiving um, an activity packet with different workbooks and ways to stay connected to your kids that we would normally hand out at an in-person event, please email me your service member, your home of record and your children's names and ages and we'll get an act packet out in the mail to you. Thank you. Good morning <laughs> with family programs and this is Nathan Parker with me. Um, we are soldier and family readiness specialists. There are 16 of us across the state. However, for the 694th deployment, Nathan Parker is the one assigned to um, the unit. So he will be handling everything and taking care of stuff for you guys. Our job so far is to make sure that you have any, um, if you have any questions, you need resources, referrals. Um, there's a lot of information that's gonna be thrown out at you today. If you didn't catch a website, if you didn't catch contact information, Nate and I will have that available. Um, following up with what Ms. Christie said with child and youth yesterday during the um, SRP, we made sure that everyone had Christie's information to make sure that you could email her. Um, throughout the deployment, uh, Nathan will be contacting each family member. Please know it is not just spouses, it's parents, it's whomever the service member has listed, and we will get any help in any way that we need possible for everyone out there. All month long, we find resources of whatever need that you may need. And that's what we are doing when we're not at SRPs and drills. So we invite you to um, test us on that and see what we can find and how we can help you. Your SFRG. Um, that would be Ms. Desiree for you guys. She is a volunteer and she will keep in touch with you throughout the deployment to make sure you know activities going on in your area and ongoings with the unit events. Nathan will be making contact each month, either via email, text, or phone calls. Your service members yesterday told us what your preference was. So if we reach out to you and it's not, let us know. Next slide. Next slide. We put the contact information for the SFRG leader and Mr. Nathan Parker. So if you have any other questions, also during the MOBE up, um, we will be available during the week. We'll try to stop by and see if you have any questions. So for family members out there, if you think of something, call, text, make sure your service member knows. We'll be glad to help you with whatever you need.
Good morning. This is George Millsap with the North Carolina National Guard's Employment Center. <clears throat> we have uh, several centers throughout the state. We cover every county in the state. And we provide employment opportunities for all of our service members, veterans, and their families. We are part of the state's effort to increase the um, employment rate for service members and veterans in North Carolina and their families. As you can see, 90% of our staff served or is currently serving. <clears throat> so we truly understand what a career transition looks like from your perspective. As the slide says, we develop proactive, positive relationships with businesses so we can help you. And when it's time to work with you, we can help you with your resume preparation, do career assessments, military to civilian work translation, which seems to be a large challenge for most of us. We can conduct mock interviews and interview techniques, training program development, hiring events. We do hiring events. We also attend hiring events and job fairs to build those relationships with other businesses. Direct contact to a network of veteran friendly employers, and we do work with the US Department of Labor for apprenticeships. Here are some of the employers that we work with. Definitely not all of them, but some of the big ones. You can see the list of locations and counselors here. As I said, my name is George Millsap and I'm in Wilmington and I cover several counties, Brunswick, New Hanover, Duplin, Onslow, Pender counties. Much is the same for all of our other uh, counselors. Feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any questions via phone or email. Here are our locations where we have offices. So, as you can see, we are kind of spread out, but we do cover the entire state. Here's the number of uh, service members and their families we've assisted 4,772. <clears throat> that was at the time this slide was built. We have continued to serve. That number grows increasingly every day. Estimated four totals. Our main office is in Raleigh at the Joint Force Headquarters. You can reach out to our main office anytime to ask any questions about employment and your opportunities, whether you're transitioning or you're a veteran or your spouse, if you're eligible to work. Reach out to us on our social media page on Facebook or the North Carolina National Guards app. Next up should be Mr. James Shaw with the Education Department. Hey, everybody. Get this going. Okay. Turn. Okay. Do I got a check from anybody? You are. You're cutting in and out a little bit.
Sergeant Hill, why don't we move on to the next one as it looks like he's having some connection issues. Next slide, please. Hey, if anybody can hear me, can somebody give me a sound check return? You are cutting in and out. Um, okay, can I, we move to the next slide, please? Okay, hey, if everybody can hear me, I'm just going to um, give you guys three talking points and make this real quick so I'm going in and out. So number one is that I, the TA is going to reset one October. So when we talk about using education benefits, one October we have four thousand dollars that's going to reset. So everybody here on this call realize that technically between now and one October you actually have four thousand dollars to spend for education, and one October that money resets. So every year the money resets one October. So I want you to take that away. You don't. Um, when you look at using federal tuition assistance, you'll uh, go to the website Army Ignited and we'll see that on the next page. The second uh, talking point is that for transcripts, if you guys turn in your transcripts for up to us, we can get those college credits added to your ERB. And the third talking point is that with testing, we offer DLPT, SIFT, and AFCT. So DLPT is if any of you guys speak a foreign language, I highly recommend you taking the DLPT. So they can get that score added to your ERB. The SIFT is if any of you guys are looking at wanting to become a pilot, you got to go and take your SIFT test. Based upon that score, we'll then determine whether or not you meet the minimum qualifications, then attend aviation on the warrant or officer side. The last talking point there is that um, the AFCT will be in regards to your GT score. Um, you obviously need a 110 in order to commission. Um, the next slide, please. So this slide right here is in regards to your chapter 33 post 9-11. I have to be honest, if I was to look at every one of you and talk to you one-on-one, more than likely, I would not recommend anybody trying to touch their VA benefits right now. If you guys are using your 1606, um, numbers don't lie, it actually be probably more beneficial to use your federal tuition assistance along with your state tuition assistance to pay for college. Continue to rack up uh, DD-214s, which will then combine if you can get to those 36 months of active duty time, then you'll get 100% post 9-11 GI Bill benefits. So I know that can get a little confusing. If you reach out to us, we can go into more depth, but just a friendly reminder is that the VA, you have 36 months of total VA benefits. So whether the VA pays you $400 per month or 4,000, it's all based upon 36 months. Next slide, please. All right, so if you look there on the top left-hand quadrant, you'll see Federal Tuition Assistance Program, Army Ignited. That's where you're gonna go in order to um, set up your account. And then we also have credentialing assistance. So what's nice about the Army here in the last 18 months is that they created what's called the CA program because a lot of individuals do not want to use um, TA money, if you will, to go to college or university. So the Army decided, hey, you know what? Maybe we can send you guys to go get welding, plumber, even pilot's license, CrossFit, it's all out there and it's on the um, Army Cool website. So you can go to Army Ignited to still request federal tuition assistance or uh, credentialing assistance money. It's $4,000 again that hits one October, but with CA, you'd go to the website Army Cool. There's about 3,000 different certificates out there that you could pursue. Again, pilot's license, CrossFit, it's all paid for. The Army will pay for these license and certificates. So again, here on this slide, uh, if you've got civilian transcripts, please uh, deliver them to us either in person or you can have them mailed to us. Or if you have the electronic copies, they can go to that org box right there. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. That's the last slide I have for the education department. Okay. 
Yeah, I appreciate that, Sergeant Hill. Hey, thanks everybody. Again, if you got questions, you got um, our contact number, and we'll make your life a little easier if you guys just reach out to us. Okay, thank you much. Out here. All right, I don't think anybody on is on for the Red Cross. Uh, what I will say about the Red Cross is if any family emergencies come up where they need to get in contact with you, the best way to do that is for to have the family member call the Red Cross and they will put in a Red Cross message to your unit. All right. Good information to have is make sure that that they have your good unit name. They have a a commander and a first sergeant's name and and a good way to uh also is to have contact with the uh rear debt people that are back here they will the red cross will then reach out and send a red cross message uh directly to your unit Next up is going to be Chaplain Watson again, and he's going to go through five steps to grow together while deployed. Good morning. This is Chaplain Watson. Radio check. We got you, sir. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. It's an awesome time to be with you this morning. And I wanted to just, did I break over somebody? No, you're good. We're getting a little bit of feedback from you. Okay. Hold on. Okay. Is that any better? <clears throat> okay. So I want to talk to you about the five steps to growing together while deployed. If you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So a few things and this, when, when I talk about these five steps to growing together, I have the family in mind. And if your family is you and, and your mom or you and your mate or you and your, your, your kids, whatever your family plan is, that's who I'm speaking to. So, number one, when we go into a deployment, we have to first adjust our mindsets, right? The way we think determines the outcome of anything that we do. So, our mindset is no different. So, let me give you an example. If you were to go into this deployment with your family and the attitude is, this is going to be a sucky year, we're all gonna be separated. You know, this is just gonna be terrible. Well, contrast that with on the other side of the continuum, if you were to look at this deployment as, yeah, we're gonna be separated for a little while, it might be difficult, but we're gonna make the best of this and we're gonna come out on top. We're gonna to decide to grow together during this deployment. So that's the kind of mindset and attitude I would ask you to think about. Now, while I'm talking, I would like for you guys, as we go through the next uh, four steps, to go ahead and drop some comments or answers in the Facebook group or on the Facebook page. So let's move down to number two. Oftentimes, the big elephant in the room is the question the soldier or either the family member is not asking the family or vice versa. So when we're, when we're going through the deployment, what I would like you to think about is in the area of communication, 
what is it that needs to be said to your family before you leave? What decisions need to be made? How are you going to communicate? This is a huge issue. If you go ahead and wrestle with it before the deployment, then you won't have to worry about it, of course, during. So what are some things that I'm talking about? And we've got some, we've got some subject matter experts in here listening to this. So I would like to see some of your comments as we talk. So what is, what is one question you would like to ask your spouse or your family about how we're going to communicate during deployment? or if you're gonna communicate at all. Not just as a chaplain, but as another soldier, I implore you to come up with a communication plan, something that you know you're gonna, it's not that you're gonna to plan to talk to a certain person on a certain day, on a certain week. The plan is that yes, we will communicate. And when we communicate, here's the way we're going to do it. You know, in a previous deployment, me and my wife decided that once a week we would have like a, a family session if it could happen. So that one night a week we would uh, all get on, um, I think it was Skype, and I would try to talk to my kids. However, we knew that if, if, if conditions were such that I couldn't get on, I would text them or whatever. But at least we had a plan in place that we would talk. Now, the next thing is, what kind of things will you talk about during the deployment? This is, this is a critical issue because there are some things you probably should not be talking about while you're deployed. There are some things your spouse needs to take care of for you. There are some things that the soldier cannot share with the, um, the family or family members, and we, we have OPSEC to think about. But oftentimes, there are things that we just don't need to share that aren't important, but we do need to think about the things that are important. So let's talk about number three. What is important is that you and your family, your spouse, you talk about making a plan for your money. What does that look like? Well, let me just say this. I know some of you are gonna make more money while you're deployed. Some of you will make less money while you're deployed. Whatever the case is for your house, we always need to make a plan, a budget, whatever you want to call it for our money. I would like to think that it's kind of fun if you include the family. For example, if you know that you're going to have an excess in your budget because of the deployment, maybe you can have a conversation with your family, your kids, about something fun that you're going to do with part of that money when you return. For example, maybe a vacation maybe add a tennis court, well, whatever it is. It could be anything that helps your family, okay? So make a plan for your money. If you don't, your money will make a plan of its own. It will disappear before your very eyes. So talk to lots of families. Money is a number one issue in marriage, right? It is a number one issue that can destroy a relationship if we don't manage it properly. So let's stay on top of things, the smart people that we are. Let's go ahead and make a plan for our money. Number four, I want you to think about this <clears throat> carefully. While you're the soldier or if you're the family member, make sure that you guard your heart. The marriage, the relationship that you've been protecting for so long, this is not time to, to drop your arms. This is not time to step away and say, oh, this is a free, free for all for six months, 12 months, whatever it is. It's not. You need to guard your heart. The Bible says that our heart is the wellspring of life, and that is where our future derives. The things that we think in our heart are the things that we act on later, the things that we do. So what are some of the ways that you can protect your heart? while you're deployed. If somebody would like to drop something in the Facebook page, a good way to protect your heart is to make sure you, you make an agreement with your loved one. 
that mate, that special person in your life, <clears throat> that you're going to do X, Y, Z, or you're going to commit to whatever. Or when there are times when you feel lonely, maybe that's when you reach out. And look, a spouse is not the only person to reach out to. Loneliness is the number one destroyer of any relationship. So when we're lonely, what do we do? What do we need to do to fill that void? Work? Pick up a book? Study? There are all kind of things that we can do to keep us sharp, to keep us from migrating into an area where we isolate ourselves from other people. No good can come from it. So remember, this is a good time to check your battle buddy also um, while you're deployed. And that leads us to number five, a plan to grow spiritually. So some of you on here are, are people of faith. Some are not. But it doesn't matter. When we grow spiritually, that means we need to do something that feeds our soul. So what is it that you can do while you're deployed to feed your soul? I'll give you some ideas of what myself and some other soldiers did on deployments. Number one, you can decide to <coughs> pick up a study book or a curriculum that you're going to go through. Um, I know a group of guys that learn how to invest in the stock market. Um, I know um, soldiers who picked up spiritual books and decided they were going to read XYZ during the deployment. You can actually read a spiritual book with your spouse or your mate at the same time. You can email each other back and forth with questions. You can, you can pick up a podcast and listen to it together. You can create your own podcast and tell stories or um, anecdotes that your kids can listen to. So there are lots of different ways that we can grow spiritually. See the chaplain. The chaplain is an opportunity for, for you to go and share your thoughts, your heart's desires. You know, we have this cloak of confidentiality. So take it, use it, see a chaplain, see your priest, see your pastor, keep close communication with people that can pray for you and lift you up not just you, but your family. And if you take these five things into mind, adjusting your mindset, making sure you have a plan for communication, making sure you have a plan for your money, guarding your heart, and then make a plan to grow spiritually, I can assure you that you and your family will grow together during this deployment. So I appreciate you having me. This is Chaplain Watson. Anything that I can do to her help, the 694th in any way, please let me know. This concludes my message. Good morning, uh, can, Sergeant Hill. Can everyone hear me okay? Roger, Sergeant Major. We got you. Roger, Sergeant Major. We got you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you heard from the Red Cross, uh, from Sergeant Martinson, talking about what happens if something uh, goes wrong while you are home uh, or at home while you are away. Uh, families, the big question that lingers heavily over everyone's mind is what happens if something happens downrange? How will I learn? Um, Casualty Operations, myself and Mass Sergeant Purcell are here to support that effort. Uh, for the In your pre-deployment phase, you just did a uh, SRP yesterday. Uh, on your DD Form 93 and the 8286 or the SOS form, uh, so the 8286 used to have to be updated by the unit itself. Now it can be updated by you on Mill Connect uh, every third day of the week if you wanted to. Uh, when you update those documents, have the conversations with your families. They are not pleasant. Nobody wants to talk about what happens in the event that they die. Uh, I am not here to sugarcoat this, and I'm not trying to be overly brisk with it either. I want you to think through that. What happens? Have you been married since the last time it was updated? Have you had kids? Think about your SGLI form. Do you have your children listed on your SGLI form? And if so, 
are they old enough to receive the funds? Because I will tell you that if they are not above the age of 18, they will not receive those funds. Those funds will have to be commuted into a trust. You can work with JAG. I, I suspect strongly that JAG was with you uh, yesterday at the SRP PHA event. So please work with JAG, work with your unit S1 shop to identify the appropriate way to identify things. Uh, additionally, on those conversations with your last will and testament, there are specific ways to speak about your last will and testament on the form 8286 or the, the SOS form. JAG can help you with that specific language. Uh, I will tell you that if there is a conflict between your DD-93 or the, the form for emergency contact, which talks talks about who will be in a position to receive any unpaid pay, who it will be making the arrangements for your funeral or interment. If there's a conflict between your last will and testament and the DD-93, the last will and testament is nothing but a strongly worded recommendation. So work with JAG to make sure that there's no conflict. Those two documents should be working hand in hand. During the deployment itself, uh, in the event that something occurs, it's not going to be the unit in the field contacting you. Uh, unit, pay attention. Don't call the families. Uh, the unit's going to impose a blackout. No communication should be leaving that unit or the immediate vicinity back to home. We want to make sure notification is done effectively and appropriately and respectfully of families. Families, or soldiers, if you say, hey, man, if something happens to me, I need you to call my wife. I appreciate that sentiment. I respect it. And I would respectfully ask you to not do that. We want to be able to make sure that the, your families receive that information in the most conscientious, respectful, and considerate manner possible. So what's going to happen is if something happens uh, in the field, it's going to flow up to, through the higher headquarters and ultimately go all the way to the top of the Department of Army. Then it's going to come back down the chain, back through the Casualty Assistance Center at Fort Bragg and my office. At that point, we'll identify notification and assistance teams, and we will get out there within four hours of us finding out about it uh, to be able to deliver that information with care and concern and compassion, teaming a chaplain with a Casualty Assistance Team officer to make sure that the family receives that information the way that they deserve to get it, with respect, with kindness, and with the love that we can bring. Uh, in the event that there is an injury, a serious injury, those notifications will travel via telephone. So either myself or the commander of the military medical facility that your soldier is in, we will be the ones contacting you. Um, in the event of a death, or if the soldier becomes officially missing, uh, then at that point, that notification happens uh, in real time and in person with a two soldier team. Again, it'll be a notification officer or an assistance officer and a chaplain. If you have any concerns with who it is that's uh, arrived at your door, by all means, please feel free to ask for identification. They should have it immediately available. Slide. Soldiers, please let that notification ta process take its uh, course, okay? This, it is designed to happen as swiftly as possible. The Army wants to be able to make sure that it makes it through all of the variables, all the questions of benefits, all the questions of the details of what, exactly what happened. So we're not giving fragmented information that may or may not be in context. There's oftentimes more things at play than what you may know. Families, please understand we're moving with the absolute most speed possible. If you find out something, please feel free to contact my office directly. My contact information will be on the last slide, uh, but contact my office directly and ask the question. It's okay. That's We want to make sure that you have accurate and confirmed information and to uh, uh, avoid any misunderstandings or miscommunications. If you have questions, ask us. Soldiers, on the DD-9, oh, back up one, please. 
back on the DD form 93 block 14. That's the block that happens underneath all the normal stuff. Uh, it's the additional information. If your family, if the family you've identified as your next of kin does not speak English as a primary language, either as a, uh, a primary or as a high degree of fluency, please let us know. I wanna make sure that we do everything we can to communicate with your families in a way that is understandable and respectful. If you give me that opportunity, then we have that opportunity to make sure that the right people go out the first time so that your family has clear and concise information in the time of their pain. If you have over 20 years in service, make sure you work with your readiness staff and your S1 channel to ensure that your 2656-5 is properly updated. If you've had any recent changes in your personnel status, i.e. having become married, divorced, having had a child, that may be a qualifying event to update that retirement eligibility form or of the form that will dictate exactly where your retirement goes. Uh, while I'm at it, I don't know uh, if Guard Association has had an opportunity to speak today or yesterday, uh, but while you're updating those things, please take the opportunity to speak with the North Carolina National Guard Association as well. If you have an election on file and there's been a change in your family status, we need to know about it and they need to update their documents. Okay, slide please. Uh, that contact information is good for myself and Master Sergeant Purcell. Uh, those, con those cell phones are monitor uh, 24 seven. I would ask that if you have routine traffic, by all means, contact our home phone or our baseline phone number, area code 984-664-6566. Uh, if you have an urgent message, by all means, please feel free to use my email address or my cell phone number, my wife can tell you, that's on all the time. Uh, if there are any questions on Facebook, I would love to be able to handle that. That is a, that's a, that's not a conversation anyone, anyone wants to have, but it is an absolutely critical one to, to pursue. Subject to any questions, Sergeant Martinson, Sergeant Hill, I am set. Thank you, Sergeant Major. I don't see any questions on Facebook at this time. Okay, thank you. Good morning, uh, this is Kevin with IBHS. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, IBHS stands for Integrated Behavioral Health Services. And basically um, we're here to, to help with clinical needs, which would be counseling, referrals for counseling, um, emergency situations, and also non-clinical support. Um, for example, let's say that there was some type of family emergency and it placed a real strain on your uh, budget for that month. Um, IBHS has um, access to funds and agencies um, that love the National Guard and uh, donate uh, for those very times uh, for soldiers and their families who might be struggling with short-term financial assistance that is not a loan, it's a grant, um, and it's because they care about you. Uh, IBHS also um, is here to brief command. Um, if a situation occurs um, and we're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's always somebody on call. And so if you leave the message on the 855 number that you see at the bottom of the screen, an on-call behavioral health specialist will contact you within um, just a few minutes. It goes through the system, it notifies the person on call and we will contact you very shortly. Um, as you can see, there are many other situations that we can help with. Um, and every clinician, for example, I'm a clinician, so we are all licensed therapists or counselors in the state of North Carolina. And then each clinician has a case manager who is 
assigned to us that deals with all of the non-clinical issues, like I mentioned earlier, financial assistance, um, employment assistance, uh, just a, a myriad of things. Next slide. Okay, so uh, just to hit a few of these briefly, um, as I mentioned, we're all credentialed um, with the state of North Carolina. We're also credentialed as telemental health clinicians, which means even if there's not an opportunity to do face-to-face -face, um, therapy, we can uh, access you through telephone or video for treatment sessions. And we found during COVID-19 and just everything that was going on with that, um, that we had a, a lot of success doing telemental health uh, services, basically because, you know, people don't have to drive to a specific place. They can just log on or they can be at a place where they can talk with the counselor. Um, crisis intervention, uh, that's really what we're here for as well. Um, if you're in a crisis and you need to talk to somebody, uh, please call that number um, and talk to someone. Of course, everything that we do um, in IBHS is confidential with a few exceptions that we will go over with you before any assessments are done so that you will know exactly how the program works um, and you will be aware of what is protected and the very few instances when we would need to notify somebody, um, but you'll be fully aware of that. And that's because we're bound by certain laws to do that. Next slide. Okay, this is just, you know, kind of a basic slide on, on what we do. Um, the last thing I'd like to mention is we have counselors spread out throughout the state. So we have a counselor in Wilmington, uh, myself in Raleigh. We have one in High Point. We have one in Charlotte. And we have one in Asheville. And we are in the process of hiring one for Fayetteville. So basically, we've got the state covered um, if there is some type of need for um, services. Uh, as well. So um, regardless of where you're at in the state, there's somebody in your region that is there to help out. At 1300, um, I will be doing a more in-depth briefing with the family members um, to explain exactly uh, in a lot more detail how we can help you while your service members are deployed. Um, so I'd I hope that you'll come back at 1300 and um, I'll be able to share some of that information with you. Thank you and I wish you the best and uh, seriously don't hesitate to reach out if you have a clinical or non-clinical need. This is just a slide in the resource that Christy Wagner went over earlier. Um, if you click that, QR code, they'll send you free books to read to your kids. It's a good way to keep connected while deployed. This is a slide in the American Legion. Uh, they're a good resource to, to use, um, get to get together with other veterans. Um, they help homeless veterans. They have college funds, uh, national emergency fund, and temporary financial assistance. This slide is for ESGR. Uh, you, your job is protected under the law so if your if your employer starts giving you issues about giving your job away or you can't come back after deployment or they're going to demote you or they're going to make you take 
leave, vacation time, uh, give Jim Lee a call. He's the regional person, the ESGR rep for your area at 919-524-1019. Again, that's for ESGR. Your employer cannot give your job away, demote you, make you take vacation time, um, and you have a certain amount of time to come back after your deployment, depending on how, how many days you're deployed. If you have any questions about your employment, give Jim Lee a call. Uh, one more thing, these slides are on the Event Plus, Plus site, the site that you signed up for when you register for the event. If you forget some of the resources or you want to click on one of the links or you want to get a number, those slides are going to be held there. Um, this slide deck and the TRICARE slide deck that we're going to use a little bit later are both going to be held right there with all the information. We're going to transfer transfer back to Mr. Harris for his next presentation. All right, hello all. Hope everybody could see me out there um, and hear me clearly. So, um, thank you all for coming back. Now, this morning we we started out with address your stress. Now we're going to get into um, finding balance. But before I do that, I, I have a uh, my son wants to. To just say say a small greetings to you all. So if you'll allow me, he's gonna um, just step in and do that at this time. So. Hello, um, I'm Carson Harris. I just want to wish y'all good health and safe deployment. All right. Very good. Very good. Hey. I was hoping uh, he he would do it for the morning one, but he 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 gets up when he gets up. So um, that's that's kind of where we are. So now uh, we're gonna go ahead and get into our, our next presentation, and I'm gonna see if I can share my screen here. Um, hope everybody can see that. And this presentation, is, of course, is called Finding Balance. I but before I but before I get into this, I really I, again I just kind of want to encourage you guys to take advantage of those resources. I, for one, even just talking about ESGR has kind of made me think about that was a, a time where I never thought that I would even have to call ESGR or ESGR representative for any reasons, but that time came. And, and so I, I just, you just never know. And um, when things will come up in your life. And so again, like we talked about before uncertainties and a part of kind of like helping out with uncertainties is kind of like writing down resources and even if I don't need them right now in my life, don't turn a deaf ear to them. Just put them in a notebook or just keep those numbers on standby for later. Man, when I called my ESGR rep, they was extremely helpful with something that I was facing at uh, at an employer that I, I, I just didn't know about. And they got things taken care of like really quick. And so um, just never know. And also life changes. You know, if you go, if you deployed before and you've been to a yellow ribbon event, as I'm sure you've been to a ton of them, and then, you know, you went out, maybe you were single that time. And then, you know, this time you go out and you're married and you have children. Well, well resources change for people with families and resources change for people that are single. And, and, and just different stages of life, these resources could take on different meanings for you in your family situation. So I just want to, again, encourage you to kind of like try to try to keep listening with an open ear and just seeing what can I pull out of this for me? Even if, if you walk away with just one thing, hopefully you walk away with more than that. But if it's just one thing that you walk away, it, it would have been so worth it to have these events and um, and to, to have these presenters come out and, and give out this information. So um, with that being said, I'll just do a quick intro again, in case anybody joined, uh, I'm the Anthony Harris, a captain in the Air Force Reserve, um, a licensed professional counselor here in the state of Georgia. Um, have been in private practice for a while uh, with with my company, Interlink Counsel Counseling, and um, also one of the, the Yellow Ribbon OSD cadre of speakers. So I get a chance to just kind of come out and go around and do different presentations, uh, which is something that I really, really love to do. But today we're going to talk about finding balance uh, at this point. And I want to start out with a story of, of a guy that I 
um, encountered and had a chance to kind of speak with some of the people that were in his circle with the Diamond Dallas Page, if you heard of that, heard of him, who has a yoga clinic in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, but there's a story about this about um, this man named Mr. Borman, Arthur Borman, who experienced the situation and just kind of the, the just start with why balance become necessary and how things in our lives could, could kind of come into play that could throw our lives off balance. And so uh, I'm going to play his story here for a minute. Um, and let's see. Hopefully you can see that. Eventually, the braces and the canes came because I could not support myself. I could not move real well. There was a man with an MD behind his name at the Veterans Administration. They uh, said that I should pretty much accept where I was at, that I would never walk normal. I pretty much accepted that I was going to die. The first time I talked with Diamond Dallas Page, he scared the hell out of me. And I came across uh, an article about Diamond Dallas Page doing yoga. And I sort of watched him over on uh, YouTube a couple of times. And I thought, to myself, I can do this. You know, if you can't run, it's really hard to lose weight. You can't run or bicycle or walk. You can't use your legs. But this was something I could do that was giving me a cardio workout. This is something I could do that was getting my heart rate up. We aren't hearing any sound on the video. All the people who want to tell you that things are impossible, that you should settle, specifically to those people who told me that I couldn't, that I was done, that I would never get better, that I would never walk normally again. Look at me now. If I can come this far without surgery, without drugs, without machines, without any of that, what could you do?
All right, thank you um, for your focus up on that. So that was just one of the important things that I kind of wanted to share um, about this story. And you may say, well, hey, you know, what, what exactly does this have to do with finding balance? Well, sometimes, you know, it's most times what I've worked with people, you know, they wanted to find balance after the recognition that things in their life had been out of balance, so to speak. In times what I'm seeing clients or I volunteer with this organization called Giving Hour, which is a kind of also a plug for them. Giving Hour is an organization that's free for service members, veterans and families. They do free counseling. They, if you go to the website Giving Hour, um, they will find you a therapist, someone you can speak with virtually, no notes, no documentations. It's just somebody that you can just sit down and, and, and just get stuff off your chest or even just talk through. And they're all licensed counselors as well. So um, I kind of just put a plug out there for them um, on top of, you know, of course, some of the resources that were named earlier. But just working in that organization and working with them, the, the thing that I experienced is that, hey, you know, when, when people realize that they need to find balance in their lives, and you kind of assess where they are currently, well, currently there is no balance. So today we're going to discuss the journey towards finding balance. And by balance, we mean the individual perception um, that all activities are compatible and promote growth in accordance with an individual's current life priorities. Uh, each of us have a competing responsibilities in our lives. Um, and let's see, each of us have, we have competing responsibilities in our lives that just, just competes for our attention and for our time. And so it becomes very challenging for us to, to, to kind of like to decide. So if you're on the group and I also appreciate, I want to kind of name out a few, a few people um, that kind of dropped some information in the chat earlier. Uh, Mr. Joseph Conway, uh, when he was talking about address your stress, talked about games, quiet times, pets, and Angel Hog talked about, you know, yeah, take a bath, drink tea. These are all really good examples. I love it. Now, I kind of want you guys to maybe say, hey, you know, what all, when you think about all of the responsibilities that you have in your lives, drop those on the chat. What, what, are the, what, is, what does that look like for you on an average day? How much time are you giving to things that I'm just obligated to do and things that I'm responsible to do? And what do those look like? And in terms of like, you know, hey, I got the kids. I got to make sure I get to school. You know, I got to go to work. I got to call the boss. Got to make sure I get the, the bills paid. Oh, the house needs to be done. Oh, yeah, I got a honey-do list that I got to do. Um, you know, I got to get that, get into the yard. When you think about responsibilities and obligations, what comes to mind for you? And I want you to just kind of take a minute to, to kind of drop some of those in the chat. I may just kind of give that a second um, to give you guys a chance to get in there and, and, and just jot a few things down. Uh, when it comes to just things that I'm responsible for. Typically the way that it will work, if you just wanna get do this exercise, you would just make a chart and you would just pretty much start writing down all and list all of the things that you're responsible for and things that you're, that you're obligated to just do. And that list would also, be, and then when you do that, you will make another chart which says, hey, what are the things that you know are fun that I consider to be pleasure? Another nine months, you know, you pass the PCS, and then the PCS, when you get you know, I know, I know, end up moving. They, that's where they like miles away from their house, and they have to to bike twenty five miles just to go to go riding the, you know, have to drive twenty five miles to go riding their bikes. You know, those things could be considered pleasure or fun. Um, but what are some other things that you consider to be pleasure and fun that you just enjoy doing? And, and I just kind of want you to, you know, just really think about that for a moment. And, and then I want to, you would compare these two lists with each other. And what I found, and when I've done this exercise at different events, I found that your list of responsibilities and obligations are far more than the things that you actually do for pleasure and fun. So you're responsible for taking care of you. Maintaining personal well-being um can be an, an easy part of life to lose and to lose in the shuffle of schedules daily meetings and deadlines right it may be it may seem like our rapid pace never slows down you know and if you if you were to go to the yellow ribbon.com um i think i have it at the end of this this briefing and you were to print out this balancing my life you know worksheet under the column of the table says pleasure and fun and if you would list those things as i've stated before and these are not necessarily things that you do on a regular basis. It could be anything that you enjoy. 
You know, you might enjoy painting, listening to music, playing sports and hunting or fishing. How much time do you get a chance to do that? I was there was this story. Um, it, it was this book called The Tyranny of the Urgent. And in this book, this this author talked about. He talked about going to visit a friend and he went and visited this friend. Um, they went that they were in college together and they was friends and they really hadn't had contact with each other for a long time. And so this author goes and and sees his friend sends, you know, word or sends a letter saying, hey, can you come visit me? Um, and of course, you know, this was an older book because he would have just sent a text message if it, if it was now. So he sends a letter saying, you know, can you come visit me? And so, you know, the friend, you know, drops everything that he's doing. He goes and sees his, his buddy from college. And what he learned was that his buddy from college was in stage four cancer. And, and that, you know, and he didn't know that. And so the friend is sitting with his buddy who is now in stage four cancer. And the friend is just kind of like in a, in a bit of a shock and just not really knowing, you know, what to say or do. And the buddy who was in stage four cancer asked his friend, you know, say, how are things going? You know, how are things going? You know, tell me about the good things. And then he says, well, you know, the business is going good. And, you know, um, you know, uh, the job, we're making income. He started talking about all of responsibilities and obligations. Everything that he mentioned was responsibilities and obligations. And then the buddy stopped him and said, you know, no, no, I want to know about the good things. What good things are happening in your life? Like when, and the guy said that he struggled to even think about when the last time he went fishing with his kids or when the last time he had a date night with his wife or when the last time he just went for a stroll in the park or went to a museum, when did he stop and really focus on the good things in life? Things that are pleasurable and fun because he was so busy and so tied to his schedule. He hadn't stopped to just really focus on the good thing. That, that was the tyranny of the urgent. That we become more focused on things that are urgent. Those things that would typically fall in the area of responsibility and obligation. And we stop focusing on those things that are important. And that's how we connect with our families. How we take time for ourselves and how we just take time to just kind of free our minds of all of the clutter from just the hustle and bustle of every day. How would you compare your list? Is anybody, would anybody dare to say in, in the, on the Facebook live to say, you know what, my list is terrible. I got a, I got a ton of obligations and responsibility and I, and I focus very little on things that are important. A ton of things that seem so urgent, like, you know, my calendar. You know, when I'm looking at it, it's always filled and I feel like I'm living from task to task rather from moment to moment. And I'm, and, and I'm missing out on so much things. Why in finding balance to start here is to start with identifying where is my time going and where is all of my energy going? Is it going to urgent matters all the time? Or am I making time for some of the important things too? You know, I remember one parent, one, one, um, it was a commander told me, he said, you know, I'm just having a difficult time connecting to my, my teenage son and he's getting older and he's just kind of wanting to go off and do his own thing. And we're just not connecting like we used to, you know, but what he, dis what he discussed was like, you know, having been so busy as a commander and tied up in his jobs and deployments that the time that he had with his son and around him, that he's, it was very little time doing things that were important. It was more like making sure that he had what he needed, making sure that he, you know, made it to school or he had the things with it. It was all of the, all of the urgent things that needed to take place, but the important things, setting, setting up patterns of relationship and communication that will last, that will keep going. You know, these are things that we have, we have to start doing now. Um, but keep in mind that finding balance does not mean that an equal amount of time invo involvement in, in satisfaction needs to be achieved in all of the categories that we're, all of the categories that we're going to discuss. But like, like, like Mr. Borman, whenever you experience a life altering situation that throws me out of balance, and it doesn't have to be as, as critical as what he experienced, something actually medical where he was serving his country, he was going, he was deploying, he was doing the mission, and then something happens and suddenly his life just becomes out of balance so much so that he almost wanted to give up on it. But he was able to rediscover that balance by putting, by starting with some of the things that were important, by starting with himself and getting things back into perspective. It may not be that, 
It could be a relationship challenge that has thrown you out of balance. It could be financial challenges that have thrown you out of balance. It could be problems with, with, with raising young kids or teenagers that is kind of throwing things out of balance for you. What is the thing that is, is challenging that, that balance in our lives, if anything at all? Being able to identify what those things are and being able to, to prioritize our, how we spend our time and where our energy goes and being able to look at urgent matters and, and important matters, obligation and responsibility and pleasure and fun, and just kind of moving on and, and, and reprioritizing life that way. How do, you, how do the size measure up for you? How do those sides measure up? I really want, I want you guys to just kind of just think about that a little bit. You know, if, if those, if, if you're feeling like one is, is bigger than the other, then here are some areas to start focusing. This is called the will of life. And this, this worksheet is also on uh, the yellow ribbon um, page. If you want to get with um, Sergeant Hill later, I'm sure he can, he can locate this and print this out and, and get it to all of you. These are the areas. So, so for Mr. Borman, Health and fitness was an area that was completely lacking. So typically what you would do is you would go through this area, um, kind of like this, I'm gonna jump to another slide and then come back. But you would go through this area, you would create a circle for, your, for you or for your family, for your children, and then you would just rate these areas. You would rate each area and decide um, how I measure up you know, how is my fun and recreation? How's my work center, my working career, health and fitness, family, home? And you would go in and, and zero, of course, from it goes from zero to 10. And you would pretty much put where you fall at each category. Like just say, for example, for Mr. Borman, health and fitness may have been at a one because he was Mr. All Harris. Mr. Harris, Sir Hill. Uh, yes, sir. All we're seeing is a white screen. We don't see the wheel. You don't see the wheel? Okay, hold on, hold on. Okay, are you seeing this this wheel? Hold on. Okay, are you seeing it now? Yes. Okay, have you guys, did you guys see the triangles that I had up here earlier? No. Oh, well, sorry about that. So, so just to go back, so here are the triangles that I was talking about. When I said list your responsibilities and obligations, this is what I was talking about. And, and also on this side, listing the things that you find pleasure and fun in. So, so those are the two areas when I was talking about those things that are urgent and those things that are important. And here is basically how you measure it up. You know, I want to know, like, do I have more responsibilities and obligations than I have pleasure in my life right now? Here's the air, here's the wheel. And, and, and a ton of research was done on this. And typically, whenever there's imbalance in, in, in our lives or in my life, so to speak, it typically would fall in one of these categories. Can look at this for a minute and ask yourself. And kind of like this is this is how I would rate that, right? On a scale of zero to ten, and you see how they have zero at the at the core meaning I'm absolutely flunking in this category and I, I just, I desperately need to do better. You would, would put where you fall, like for Mr. Arthur Borman and the video that we saw, he would be somewhere, you know, maybe around here because, you know, he, 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 it just, because of the deployment and the issue that he had with jumping, it challenged his health in such a way that he, he's almost given up on that. So he may fall in, in an area of, of one, right? And so that's something that I want you guys to consider. He would be here when it comes to, when it, and then that starts to impact other areas of his life, his, 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 his personal growth, his spiritual self, his ethical self, probably. You know, when we found that, when I've worked with people that have, have been suicidal, which we know that that has been an extremely challenging issue for veterans daily, Daily, the number is, is too much for veterans. But when you look at a circle of somebody that has gotten that low in life, it is com it's off balance. There's no balance. Family for people that are struggling to that degree is out of balance. Finances typically is out of balance. Personal growth is out of balance because 
a lot of areas starts to, to, to impact the other areas that we live in. And so let me just go back and say, hey, here, here, here we are. Where do you fall? If you were to draw that circle and rate each of these categories on a scale of zero to 10, what is your work and career like? What is your health and fitness? Well, if you're deploying, I'm, I'm sure your fitness might be pretty, pretty good, but, um, but we can all be physically fit, but maybe sometimes not so much socially, or maybe not so much mentally. We can be socially fit, but you know, sometimes not so much spiritually or mentally. Where do these area fall? And, 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 and then, how, and we'll get into that next. And so here's, here's just an example, work and career. Do you enjoy what you do? Just some things to think about as you rate these areas of your life. Do you enjoy what you do? Or do you feel like you're making a contribution to your community in terms of your work and your career? Or do you just feel like I just got a job and I go to it every day. I hate it. I want to do something different. Well, there's possible an area of improvement and guess what? There are so many resources for service members and families when it comes to career change. There are people that are that help you with resumes. Any military and one source I think was mentioned. Pretty sure there are some local resources in your area at your base where you can sit down and and, and work on that that government resume, or you can uh, you know so that you can go for that GS position. Um, man, there there um, heroes to hire. That there are very so many different people that could help if you. But it, it starts with identifying the need. Family and home. Are you happy with your home life? Are the relationships what you want it to be? Are you are you are you meeting the challenges of of of, of marital satisfaction? Is communication flowing well? Or are there some difficulties in that area? And we all know statistically, when there are challenges at home prior to deployment, those challenges and communication are typically exacerbated due to the distance. Are we taking care of those things at home before we step out the door? What is that on a scale of zero to 10 for you? Finances, is your standard of living what you want it to be? Have you planned for your future? If you have children, have you planned for their education? Have you talked to one of the PFCs, uh, financial counselors that I think could be uh, reached through military one source? Do you have a budget? Because sometimes, remember, we go back to address your stress if you for a moment, and we talked about how do we manage the uncertainties of life. Um, I saw some research where after post after COVID, you know, not after COVID, but you know, during you know the COVID nineteen era, people had discovered the importance of having a budget and planning for their finances so that they can some somewhat financially anticipate hardships to come. But that starts with knowing where I am in terms of my finances. It's setting some financial goals. Personal growth, are you achieving your personal desires in terms of education and self-development? And do you take, you know, do you take time for yourself? You know, where, where does this fall for you? Social and cultural, do you have friends who enrich your life and contribute to your sense of well-being? This is, this is very important, you know, are the friends that I'm around or do they reflect the values that I currently have for myself? Maybe, maybe, maybe the group of people that I'm with no longer reflect the person that I want to be. Maybe they reflect the person that I've been, but not so much the person that I would like to become. And do I have a confidant with whom you can discuss important matters? interest outside of your family and career. You know, these are all also in itself, these are very important to make sure that we have balance. But as we, if we were to really dig into each one of these, they, they probably could be a breakout within itself because they, these are all positive factors that lessen, or now I would say all positive factors that promote resiliency in themselves. When you look at a person's social and, and cultural connection and how, if they're able to answer these questions positively, then they are more likely to be resilient whenever they meet life challenges. Spiritual and ethical, is religion important to you? If so, are you content with the way you are practicing your faith? And do you believe in specific personal values? And are you living up to those personal values? 
I think I heard um, Chaplin came on. So I know you all have a, a chaplain that's assigned to you, and I'm pretty sure he can be a great, I believe it's Chaplain Watson, I want to say. Um, I'm sure he can be a great resource to you in, in, in this area. Um, fun and recreation, of course, do you participate in activities that give you enjoyment? And do you take advantage of the recreational opportunity in the locations in which you live? Uh, you know, that's just one thing for me. Whenever, you know, I go to a different base or I go somewhere or deploy somewhere, you know, the first thing I typically do is find a gym, the chow hall, and where I'm supposed to report for the next duty day so that I can at least establish, uh, you know, my, my recreational. This is a very important part of my life, but I want to make sure, first and foremost, that I kind of lock this part in because I know that this is necessary for my um, balance and resiliency and health and fitness. Do you feel healthy? Do you exercise and eat the way you would like to? And service members, this is not for you. I hope that your family members are kind of listening in a little bit too and just taking this as an opportunity for reevaluation and um, just to kind of check out. And this can be a family activity, you know, and say, hey, we don't have to wait till New Year's to start making some uh, New Year's resolutions. We can We can see this deployment, we can see this presentation as an opportunity to to just reevaluate where we stand in these various areas. And I guarantee you, there has not, and, and some of the, the, the providers or the clinicians that I've heard talking earlier can come on here and say, yes, if anybody comes to see a counselor or it is in within one of these areas that, that challenges are there, <laughs> whether it's in family, finances, whether it's just personal growth, or work, or, you know, or health and fitness, that these are, you know, the main categories that we, you know, we typically exist in. So we want to make sure that we are thriving in those areas. So I won't beat a dead horse, but the course, here's an example. This is not my will, but it could potentially look like this. There's not a smooth circle here in the middle. If you need this. It, it's the circle right here is just kind of like, you know, um, it's just bumpy. You know, it, there's if in our goal is to get this circle, this middle circle to a point to where, you know, it's smooth, it flows, it makes sense. But see, this person family is a little less than health and fitness and spiritual and ethical is a little less than fun and recreation. Uh, social and cultural is a, is a lot more than personal growth. And it's not to say that all areas will ever be perfect, but it's to make sure that it, it's in a way that works for you that it is in line with your values and your goals and so that's one thing that you just want to make sure like hey is this circle helping me be my best me and and as my 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 um you know son would say or kids would say you know is this helping me live my best life so to speak so how bumpy a ride would it be if this was a real wheel Right. If you see this, this wheel of balance, this is not very, uh, not very balanced wheel. So just consider, you know, hey, why is my life so, you know, why things seem so, so labored and, and just challenging and difficult? Because, yeah, while I'm going to work, yeah, I might be stressed out with my boss. I might be late on getting some taskers done. But how do, how do I connect, you know, what's happening at work to my health and fitness not being where I want it to be? Well, this is kind of a part of the wheel of life. Yes, that all, all of those areas can be impactful and it may not be me not being a great soldier or a great airman or sailor. It just could mean that, hey, there are some other areas in my life that are not as smooth and, and, and exactly not where I want them to be. So, OK, so how do we really get there? I'm sure to sure you've heard of this. Start with smart goals. Write down your goals. Set short, mid and long term goals. Set smart goals, specific, measurable achievable, relevant, time-bound. Be specific about what it is that you want to do. And, and, and not only that, as you have all of these areas to set goals in, what is a smart goal that I can set for health and fitness? Work, career, you know, what is a goal that I can set when, when it comes to that wheel of life? I can go in and set a goal for each of those areas for myself. And may, I want to make sure that I make that goal measurable. Okay, well, if, if I want to work on my finances, well, how do I want to work on my finances? And you, know, you just can't say, I want to make bank. You know, wow, that sounds pretty cool. But how are we going to make bank? How are we going to get there? Well, I, I, you have to measure that. Well, I want to start by, I want to start by saving X amount every week and putting this back. 
And then I want to invest that into something. Is that achievable? It is irrelevant. How was that relevant to me? And, and of all of these, these um, standards within the SMART goals, I like relevant more because relevance is based on values. When you talk about setting something that's relevant to you, well, a triathlon in health and fitness probably won't be on my goal list because that's not necessarily something that's relevant to me, but it could be to some. You know, and so is it relevant to who you are? And this requires just a little bit of emotional intelligence when it comes to like, hey, self-awareness. And sometimes we're setting goals and, and they're not necessarily based on us per se. They could be based on what other people want for us or it could be based on what we see other people doing and not necessarily something that really fits who I am and what I want to do. So is it relevant and is it time bound? Do I have a time limit on there so that I'm, I'm more apt to achieve it? I hope you can see this slide. Um, this will be a great activity for you to do. Um, it's a values clarification. As I stated before, when it comes to that, that relevancy stage of setting a SMART goal, that tends to point more, to, more towards values. If I, if, I, if I can discover what on my wheel of life is relevant in terms of the type of goal that I want to set, then I have to look at, well, how does, that connect to, how does that connect to me as a person or as a soldier? And is that relevant to me? You know, that was that was one airman I can remember one time who um, I remember we got a, a brand new commander that came into the squadron and, and I think he had really great intentions. This airman, this commander said, you know, hey, who's airman so and so? They seem high speed. They seem like they do a good job. You know, um, I want to talk to them about going to get their associate's degree and getting their bachelor's degree. Well, little did he know that this airman was working on a Ph.D. But and, but in his mind, he associated degrees. Okay, if you got a degree, then you're probably an officer. But he he didn't realize that. Well, no, she just don't want to be an officer, and that goal of commissioning is not relevant to her. She's satisfied with having a PhD and still being enlisted. That's what she wanted to do. And so, learning that though, and learning like what is the relevancy because that commissioning obviously wasn't a part of you know her values at the time. It's not something that was was within her scope, and that's okay. But other other people sometimes may want to to project those values onto you because of you know what they see. But your values are the beliefs that define what is what is important to you. They guide each of your choices in life. For example, someone who values family might try to spend extra time at home, right? And while someone who values success in their career may may do just the opposite. So understanding your values will help you recognize areas of your life that needs more attention and what prioritize and what to prioritize in the future. This is just a little simple tool. Um, select the 10 most important items from the following list. You can rank them from one to 10, with one being the most important item, correct? And you can take all of those ones, sit them aside, and you can go back to that wheel of life and figure out, okay, if this is a value, am I living this value to get to the best parts of my life? When I was going through basic training, of course, I'm in the Air Force, so y'all don't, don't clown me too hard, but when I was going through, I know some of you probably said, but what is basic training, really? Uh, but yeah, when I was going through what we thought to be basic training anyway at Lackland Air Force Base, um, we would always have to, we was learning our core values and the Air Force core values are service before self, excellence in all we do and integrity first. And we would always have to say these core values as we walked across a threshold to go to the latrine. Um, and so, and our, our MTI would sit right there by that threshold so that if one of us didn't say one of the core values when we crossed that threshold, of course, we would know that pretty soon um, and, and, and regrettably so we would know that. And so we made it a habit to say those values every single time. I thought that this was like really silly. I'm like, okay, this is just silly. We kind of like, okay, this, just do it. Just get through it. Um, so every time you walk by there, you like service before self, integrity first, that's not all we do. You just keep saying it every time you go by. But what I found was um, that I really started to live these values that I was saying to myself over and over and over again. And I don't, it don't take a rocket science or the world's first class psychiatrist to tell you that you started to live the things that you tell yourself on a regular basis. And some of you know this, and I'm pretty sure some of you've experienced this before to be true. The things that I tell myself are the things that typically that seems to come out in my behavior. And then I noticed something that I really started to, to try to make my bed in an excellent way. I, I tried to, to start, you know, um, 
to 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 putting service really before myself. I started finding myself wanting to to look for opportunities to serve other people other than myself. And this is coming from a college, you know, student, you know, um, who was fresh out of, who, who left, I, I left my freshman year in college and went to basic training. And then I returned to college after I finished all of my military training. But I was in the most me focused, self-focused part of my life. But these values and saying these values repeatedly to myself over and over again, I started to live them. They started to show up and how I interacted with people, how I started to carry myself in public, how I started to, to make my bed and march, and how I studied for my exams. And those values came back to me when I came, when I returned to college, and it didn't change. I still tried to live those values. So if you take nothing else from this brief and take this, that the things that you tell yourself over and over and over again are the things that will show up in your behavior and how you function. And so here's an opportunity to write down, if you, if you were to just notate all of your ones that you pick out on here, look for those ones in your life. And, and are you telling, if, if that is something that I value, is that something that I could experience and see in my life every day? That will help me to, to achieving the balance that I want. So the Smart Goal Handout is available for download at the Yellow Ribbon website. Um, and you can find that here at uh, yellowribbon.mil. And uh, if I'm also starting to heal, I'm sure can um, can hook you up with that. And you may use the wheel as a measure of balance to gauge your overall degree of life satisfaction and to identify areas that might that might benefit from some goals. And so you might be knocking out one area of your life and that's cool. You might be killing it when it comes to family and home, but then you might see another area that's lacking. And so you use those smart goals to try to bring that area up a little bit, you know, say, hey, you know, I can use some work here. I could use this, 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 this values clarification. Am I living my values or am, am, and am I, are my goals, uh, value oriented, you know, a value based, so to speak. Cause you know, sometimes we just set goals just to set them, but we don't have a real relevant smart goals connection to those goals. So here's an opportunity to use the values clarification and a smart goal tool to increase the areas in my life that I would like to increase. And, you know, lastly, identify an area in which you would like to increase your level of satisfaction and answer the following question. If blank were a 10 for me, what three things would be happening? It's a great question. If finances were a 10 for me, what would be happening? Some probably say, well, I have that, uh, that Lamborghini I want, you know, I'll, I'll have, a you know, a, I'll, a, a really nice savings account, or I would have a, a nice boat. If if finance if finances just using one were a ten for me, what three things would be happening? What three things would be different in my life? If family and home were a ten, what three things would be different for me? Would it make a difference in, in communication at home? Would it make a difference in in, in intimacy and in connection? Would there be more date nights, be more family games, fun, you know, would there be more connection? Or even if, if I'm single, you know, in, in social and cultural were a 10 for me, what three things would be happening? It's a great question to consider. Lastly, folks, um, the objectives for, for finding balance is um, simply just identify opportunities to bring more balance to specific areas of your life. And just really learn how to set goals for addressing areas of your life that require more, more attention. This is, this is something that we can, can, can not, can never have too much of, and we can always benefit from just taking the time to reflect and just reevaluate what that looks like for us. Um, so with all that being said, that is the conclusion of, of finding balance. Um, and I will, as, as I did earlier, stand by for a moment or two um, just to take any questions if you have them. I thank you all just for your attention and time. And um, I wish you well on, on this deployment and your journey and, and wish your families well as they take care of the home front for you. And um, yeah, let me know if you have any questions. Over to you, Sergeant Hill. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris. Uh, we're going to move right on to TRICARE. Let me get that brief up in just a second.
Okay. Brian, can you hear me? I sure can. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start now. And are you, go you're going to move my uh, slides forward, correct? Yes. Okay. All right. So go ahead and go to the next one. Hey, everybody. I'm, I'm Linda Edwards. I'm the TRICARE representative for this area. And we're going to go over some of the benefits and programs. Now this, for this um, segment right now, it's going to be super quick because um, this afternoon we're going to get into the, um, the rules and prices and stuff for TRICARE. Uh, right now, we're just gonna move through smoothly and this afternoon at the 1 1.30 briefing, we'll be answering questions and having that. Go to the next one, please. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about TRICARE eligibility and the coverage and a lot of other information. Um, next one, please. Okay, so um, when you go on active duty and when, um, even if it's just for the weekend or the week, the military hospitals are your first point of where you should get your medical care. Um, if you live near one, all right. Um, and you can get civilian health care off base if you're enrolled in TRICARE Reserve Select or if you're on um, active duty and your family's on active duty. So all these options are available to you. Next. All right. So TRICARE can be used anywhere in the United States. That's including Hawaii, Alaska, and it can be used overseas too. Um, but while, when you do go on active duty for the active duty service member, you're gonna be on TRICARE Prime and your family's going to have the option to choose other programs. As a service member, you won't have to worry about um, where your care is going to be because you're going to be with your unit and they're going to make sure that you have a primary care doctor that's close. So um, next one. Next, please. Okay. And so what's really important with TRICARE because we kind of a partner with DEERS. We use their information from their um, from their system to make sure your benefits are up to date and that you have the correct benefits. If something's not correct in DEERS, it's not gonna be correct in TRICARE. So you have to make sure that that information's gonna be good. So if your family, while you're on active duty um, and deployed, and your family moves to Ohio to be with their parents during that time, then they'll wanna update their DEERS information to the Ohio address for the family part. Make sure you do that. And the phone numbers are super important because if something happens and we need to contact you for a denied claim or something, we need to be able to contact you so we can talk to you and get that bill paid. So just make sure you have all that information up to date. Next. Okay, so this is the life cycle for um for your status right now. So inactive status, you can choose to go into Tricare Reserve Select. We're going to talk about more about that later. And later in life, retired reserve. If you choose to do that, and of course, if you hurt yourself in line of duty, there is a program for that too. Um, no back. Okay, preactivation. Early eligibility, 180 days before you leave. You and your family are allowed to um, enroll yourself into TRICARE Prime. And then once you are active duty, then it's um, you're going to have, it's going to all change to the active duty screen. And then when you deactivate, there's other programs going to, it's going to come up for you. Okay, so uh, there's going to be some changes depending on how long you're going to be there is how long you're going to have TRICARE. Next. Next. Okay, so like I said, early eligibility is 180 days. Um, just make sure that you understand that and call TRICARE. Next. Okay, so um, it's for everybody, reserve and National Guard, and um, you'll be able to get care at the hospital for urgent cares, emergency rooms. Uh, just make sure you call TRICARE and get them enrolled uh, before the 180, you know, they, during that 180 days, because it depends on you. You have to act. You have to enroll. It's not automatic. That's what I want to mean. Next. 
Okay, so of course, specialty care is included in that emergency care. And um, if you're living, going to be living near a military hospital, they could be assigned there. Your family could be assigned there as well as you while you're still in CONUS. Next. Okay, so these are the programs that are available for you and your family. Tricare Prime is what you're going to have, the, fam the active duty service member. Your family can, can choose to have Tricare Prime. TRICARE Prime also, while you're on active duty, it's going to be free for them. They could choose TRICARE Select, not you though, only your family. Um, this is also free for active duty family members with exception to there's going to be some high co-pays. So TRICARE Prime is totally free. TRICARE Select has co-pays, cost shares. We're going to get more into that this afternoon. If you don't live around anything and super far away, like in the mountains, then you'll be able to go into TRICARE Prime Remote and we'll try to find a doctor around your area that's going to be assigned. This is for your family only, not for the active duty service member. Um, TRICARE Young Adult, if you have a child who's 23 years old up to 26, we have a program for them that you have to pay for. Even active duty family members have to pay for this one. So if you want them to have um, insurance, they don't have it any other way. This is a way to have it. We'll talk about those, um, how much that costs later and this afternoon. And the last one is the family health plans. These are, this is like an old dinosaur that's hung around the military for a while, these six designated areas. They're just like clinics that take care of um, people who wanna use your TRICARE Prime there. The only downside of this one is that if you use one of those programs or areas, then you can't use a military treatment facility. So we'll just keep that in mind. I don't, a lot of people do not use those. So um, track your prime remote for active duty family members, remember, Yes, you can have one. You can be in TRICARE Prime Remote as long as you're far enough away. You see, it says more than 50 miles from a military hospital. So um, if you are more than 50 miles from the closest military hospital, then you will be assigned either to TRICARE Prime off base or TRICARE Prime Remote, depending on your zip code. Next. Okay, so this is... Um, this is going to come into play if you choose uh, after you get out, because everything's free when you get, um, when you're an active duty family member or active duty service member. But when you get out um, or get out or de on um, the deactivate or the after you get out of the, the reserve and you spend your 20 years and you retire, um, the group A and group B is gonna come into play then, not right now. So next. Okay, so a little bit about TRICARE Prime. Of course, it's affordable. It's free. And it works very well. The only difference, which, well, well, there's a lot of uh, difference, but the most important difference between Prime and Select is Prime always needs, you're going to be assigned to a primary care doctor, and that primary care doctor is the one who sends you out for specialty care. So you have to have permission to be seen anywhere besides an emergency room or an urgent care. Next. So the costs and fees are all online. This afternoon, when we talk about that, we're not going to get specific with the costs and fees. I'm going to have you go online and find your costs and fees because that's how it's going to have to be when I'm not here. You're going to have to be able to find it yourself. So um, Prime, totally free. Don't have to worry about anything. If you do, if you go off base to a specialist and you don't have a referral, you're going to pay a lot of money out of your pocket. So make sure that doesn't happen. And there is a cat cap for the family. That catastrophic caps or is an amount that um, the the amount that you're you have to pay every year the the highest amount. So I think it's a thousand dollars for active duty family members for Tricare Prime. Um, which that's the most amount of money that's going to come out of your pocket during one year. So we don't like to break, break the bank. Okay, next. TRICARE Select is that program only for family members. So they can choose this over Prime and it works. And if they're going to be out of an area 
and they don't want a military doctor or any doctor telling them where to go for their health care. They this is a good program for them because they this is a self managed program. They um, pick their own doctors even if they're non network. You just have a higher cost share. So you see, it has deductibles and cost shares. You do have to enroll, but there's no enrollment fee, which is great. Okay. Um, and if you use some of the providers that are non network, you could have to file your own claims. That doesn't happen too much, though. Next. Okay, so um, you'll want to use network doctors if you want to pay the lowest copay. All this is online at tricare.mil. You can find a doctor, you can look at your costs of fees, you can look at the catastrophic cap and the deductibles. Everything's online with TRICARE. Um, and so you just have to make sure that you get online. I would get online, make sure, do a little research before you pick which one you're going to have. Next. So as I said before, no enrollment fees. There's going to be some deductibles, so make sure that you um, do that. Now, it says here the TRICARE select yearly deductibles way for National Guard and Reserves. Call to order for more than 30 days. So, if you fall into that category, then you're not going to have to worry about a deductible, which is wonderful because I think it's $1,500. Um, and cost shares and co-payments aren't waived, though. So, those co can go up as far as, I think it's $140 for an emergency room. But you'll want to check that, okay? Um, and the catastrophic cap is per family for cover services a year. So, that is the most you're going to pay out of your pocket. And once again, go to tricare.mil for all those specific costs. Next. All right, so in, to enroll in this, of course, you can do it just by filling out a form and mailing it in if you want, but I wouldn't do it that way. I call TRICARE and enroll over, over the line. You'll talk to a person. They'll get you enrolled that day to a provider, give you their number. Everything will go smoothly if you do it online. Um, you can also do this online the website too on the bwe website instead of calling if you um, had success with that before i haven't had anybody say they had any problems so you can do it by that also next you don't have to worry about tricare plus you're not tricare plus is for those 65 years and older next okay so this is the program where it's for the 23 to 26 year old children. Um, now, while they're in college up to the age of 23, on their birthday of the 23rd, they're cut off. Um, but up to the age of 23, they're covered by your insurance. So if you have a child in college right now, they will be able, to, and they're under the age of 23, they will be able to enroll in whatever program you're going to enroll in. All right. And also, you don't have to have every member on the same program. So, if TRICARE Select works better for your daughter in college, then TRICARE Prime works, and you can enroll her in Select and the others in Prime. Next. This is those six service areas. You can see they're very specific where they are, um, and they're they're just like TRICARE, um, TRICARE PCMs. You, you have to have TRICARE Prime to use one of these places. Um, so if you're gonna be going to one of those, you can enroll in there if you want to, but remember you can't use a military hospital. Next. Skip this one, there we go. Okay, speaking about military hospitals, um, Active duty always are seen first in a military hospital, then comes your family members. So they shouldn't have any problems making an appointment. If they do, then they need to see the benefits advisor at that base. Every base has at least one or two benefits advisors. Next. Pharmacy should be free. All right. So if you're close to a military treatment facility and um, you need a prescription, I would go there. You can get it for free. 
All right, but if you choose to go off base while you're enrolled in TRICARE Prime or Select, you'll be able to use any retail network pharmacy um, around. It's like Walmart, Target, Walgreens, Rite Aid, things like that. They can ones like that. They can um, they'll take TRICARE and they will charge nothing to the active duty service member. But for the family member, you do have to uh, like a ten dollar fee. I think can go all the way up to sixty nine. Okay, so. Um, just make sure when you walk into a pharmacy and it's retail, that means um, not on a base, then just ask them if they take TRICARE before you give them your prescription. Non-network are those places that don't take it, so don't go one of those. All right. So um, active du duty, while you're on active duty, you still can get dental benefits. Of course, we want you to get them on a base, but if you're not on a base, then there's other programs that you can use, okay? And that's this active duty dental benefit. Um, so sponsors automatically just roll and covered as an active duty service member. So this is for when you're not, my finger's getting bigger. If, um, this is for when you're not active duty, you can sign up for this and you can still have health care. Next, I mean, dental care. And this is just more about it. United Concordia runs it. If you wanted to get into that, you could go um, on there and enroll. When you enroll, they want a month's, pro, a month's up front. Okay, you can see here that the prices are here. But I, this, I wouldn't, I, I would still go online because they're increasing prices as we speak on, um, on premium. So just make sure that you have you go into the most recent information on that, which would be on the website. Next. Okay, so this is just another handy dandy, um, like a rule slide that tells you your survivor benefits. If you're active, if activated more than 30 days, then your family and your family and surviving spouse will have medical coverage. And we're gonna get into this a little bit more later. Next. Okay, so if it's less and you're serving on active duty for a period of 30 consecutive days or less, then they have retiree benefit costs and they're eligible for the survivor benefits. Okay, so we, um, we'll take care of them. Next. Okay, but if you're not activated, um, then if TRS coverage in effect, then it'll, they got six months of TRS coverage and then we'd have to take them off of it. Okay, next. Affordable Care Act is just at um, Obama site. All right, you go on to the Affordable Care Act site, but you don't need to do that. You're gonna get everything for after duty. You'll get it for free. Your family members might have a little bit of a cost share coming out of their pocket, depending on what they choose. Um, but Everybody gets a 1095 every year. Just keep it with your um, IRS taxes. It's not mandatory anymore to have health insurance. Next. And next. These are phone numbers for TRICARE. Um, I take a picture of it, put it in your phone, and make sure that um, you keep it as a contact, your, especially your, your wife or your spouse during your time overseas or deployed, they might need this number sometime and it's best to have it in their contacts, okay? And that would be the East region if you're staying here on this side. If they move on the other side of the United States, that's the West region, and they'd have to enroll with the West region to have coverage. So just make sure they know that. We'll talk about that more this afternoon. Okay, so, um, we just talked, we went through that really super fast, but this afternoon we're gonna have a lot of time to talk and answer questions about TRICARE. Is there any questions right now that I can answer? Perfect. I don't see any questions right now. Um, Perfect. We'll move on to VA, and hopefully we'll have some people come on and ask questions in the afternoon session. Thanks. See you this afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Angela Lee. I'm from the Department of Veteran Affairs. I'm going to go over briefly our benefits and services that we offer. 
to those service members that are recently redeploying from their service. Um, the VA mission is to care for those who've borne the mantle and their families and their survivors. Our values are integrity, commitment, advocacy, respect, and excellence. Next slide. These are a couple of the services that we make sure that the service member are, is connected with upon your redeployment and your completion of your 1010. Um, we will contact you, get you set up with a, prim a primary care appointment as well as a case manager for up to 90 days. If you need more, then we can also uh, do that for you. Next slide. These are some of the specialty services that we offer at the VA. These services can be utilized by the returning service members. They just have to have a consult put in by their primary care manager, and we will facilitate that as well as putting in the dental consult for you if you want the one dental cleaning for free in the VA or in the community. Just let your case manager know. I'll give you a brief moment to review that slide. Next slide. The vet center is also an option. We work very closely with the vet center, especially if you need any mental health assistance or anything like that, due to the fact that we're not able to get you in immediately for any mental health needs. Um, those counselors uh, are on site 24 seven and they're able to help you with any of your assistances. We can get you connected um, at any time. That is a walk-in basis and they will make you appointments if you need. At the bottom is the vet center 1-800 or 1-87 number, as well as the website. If you don't want to contact anybody by phone and you want to send an email. Those that are eligible are our veterans, active duty service members, returning National Guard reservists, and those who came back from combat. Next slide. Do I have any questions at this time? Like I said, it was very brief, um, but our main mission is once you do come back from deployment, we get your 1010s, your DD-214s, we get you enrolled, we'll do the pre-registration and we'll get you set up for primary care case manager and find out what your dental needs are upon for that first dental cleaning. I'm open for any questions right now for the VA. I don't see any questions at this moment. All right, have a good afternoon. Also, soldiers, one thing to note, if you get a disability payment for the VA, you should go to the VA and tell them to stop that during the deployment or you will incur debt. So make sure you put a stop on your VA disability uh, payments if you are receiving those. 